right, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Brass Tack Bodybuilding. And today I'm joined with the one and only uh, Phil Viz. How you doing, man? What's going on, brother? Wow. Just got back to training. You know, you know everything that's going on for you. If those of you who don't know, actually, because I haven't even talked about this yet because I haven't been training. Um, I am working with Phil now. Phil is going to be my coach moving forward, going into prep and everything. You know, I have been training for nine weeks, but... I'm on my third day back now, so that's news, I guess, right? Yeah, we're, uh, you know, we're just working on uh, figuring out the the issue at hand and uh, moving forward, making sure we can mitigate it if anything manifests itself in the future. You know, that's the real concern. Um, we're mm-hmm. not really concerned with something like off-season. We're concerned with being four weeks out and something flaring, you know, and, yeah. and that affecting, uh, you know, something very important because uh, as most of you people viewing this uh, know, Sebastian has a phenomenal world-class physique. I truly believe he can be a top five Olympian, maybe even Mr. Olympia one day. <laughs> um, but he's got to get around this problem. He's got to make sure he avoids making, you know, certain mistakes that young guys make and just follow the right path in general. Um, we've, we've seen countless next Mr. Olympias, right. But then we, we don't hear from those people again, or they never reach where they, where we thought they were going to reach. And a lot of times it's because they, they, they make them some type of mistake along the line, along the road, you know, um, for classic guys, a lot of times they're very impatient. And me and Sebastian have talked about this a lot for probably like a couple of years now about being patient and taking your time, especially if you're in classic. Um, we've seen this in open bodybuilding countless times, more times than you can remember, that somebody is just so anxious to blow up so fast that they end up blowing out their lines. And uh, for the younger, I'm going to try to you know keep this in line with the um the thought that you have a younger listener base here which is phenomenal yeah well um, the most the, upper- the demographic mostly listen to this is going to be probably you know not guys that are already super involved in bodybuilding you know the guys who already well, know it's going to be like the you. future of our sport yeah yeah all the people listening right now even if you don't compete right now you may decide to along the lines down the road a lot of times people are in the gym you know it happened to me I never thought about bodybuilding. Somebody came up to me in the gym and said, you look good. Have you ever thought about competing? You know, and that's what's going to happen to a lot of you guys. It's going to kind of maybe sometimes happen by accident. You've got your diehard young guys that come into this that have been doing it all their lives. But then you've got your guys that start in their mid 20s, late 20s, early 30s. You know, you never know. You might have been just doing this because you love it. And somebody didn't look at you and like, hey, are you a pro or are you a competitor? Be Like, no, I just do like you should. And then those people jump in and they find that they love it. And that it uh they're pretty good at it, you know. So this your listener base is the future of our sport. So I'm gonna try to keep my my talking points um as uh, comprehensive and simple as I can, so that everybody can kind of relate and understand. So you know I might talk a little too much and elaborate on certain things. That's why I wanted to uh, explain what blowing out somebody's lines is. Um, a lot of times people are trying to grow their legs, for example. And they end up squatting really heavy and loading their waistline really heavy. And by the time their legs are big, well, your waist has just grown three inches too, you know? And yeah. there's these fallacies that you'll hear people say like, oh, your waist has to grow if you put on overall size and this and that. Well, listen, I, I protected my waist most of my career um, as the first, as primary focus. And if you watch my waist from the time I was 19 years old to the time I was 35 years old, it barely changed. And it's because I kept an eye on it and made sure that I didn't do those things. If you look at 90% of the guys with big legs, they also have big waists. But well, if you, take you, your say, forward, you say preserve your waist. So what do you mean by that exactly? Like, what do you like wearing a belt? Like, are there certain things that you could do? There's, to... there's, there's a lot of things that go into it. For, the first thing is force feeding, right? Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of guys are just so anxious to blow up. They force feed or they eat these insanely large amounts of food. What happens is you end up stretching out your transverse abdominal wall first off, which is the internal layer of your of your abs. And it holds your stomach in. And that's what's responsible for you having a flat stomach and a tiny waist. That's why you see like truckers, for example, or people that have desk jobs, they have bellies. But if you were to grab the body fat, 
there's there's not a lot to pinch, but their stomach's out of mile. You're like, what the hell? It's because all the fat is on the inside or their transverse abdominal wall has been stretched out from sitting there slumped down, relaxed and not keeping it contracted and, and, and tense. So you'll see if people that are more active on a regular basis that walk around more on a regular basis, their stomachs tend to be flatter simply because their transverse abdominal wall is stronger. Another issue is visceral fat, which surrounds the internal organs and pushes the stomach out, right? Yeah. And that comes from overeating and becoming desensitized, in, to insulin resistance, basically. And eventually they build that up. And the third thing is loading your waistline and your obliques growing. Now, your obliques are a very thin, small muscle group, but you can make them grow. You see a lot of open bodybuilders, they flex down on their abs, their obliques pop out. And, yeah. and we don't want that, uh, especially in classic. And it, you you will eventually build those muscles up. I did eventually by the time I was 38, squatting a lot my whole life. You could see my my obliques were a little more muscular than when I had began. And that's what we try to avoid, you know. So if I have to, for example, keep you from squatting 500 pounds and, you know, we arrive at our destination 18 months later than we probably could have had we went to, went to war with the squats, I'm okay with that. You know, because we've talked about your longevity and we've yeah. talked about the fact that you're so far ahead right now. We don't need to rush. You're not going to be hitting your prime till you're almost 30. You know, well, it's funny so that you say that because there's people that I literally asked me on my Instagram post the other day, you know, why are you why have you been doing this for so long? And there's guys that are further ahead of you at your age than you are. And I'm like, there's probably like only a handful genetic freaks. Bruce. Yeah. Yeah, Urs, I don't know anybody else that's really like 23. There's there's just some guys, like the open guys, but then that comes down to what you were saying. Like the when we're talking about open guys, they're pushing way more food. And that's why we see those problems within open a lot more, you know, the descending guts and whatnot, the insulin resistance, just because not managing insulin sensitivity, taking growth hormone, all those things. Well, there, 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 uh, there's a big misconception in this sport with you know, people being ahead of others and people being on other people's timelines. And I think that it, it, it just generally puts pressure on people, unneeded pressure. And it's, mis, it's a bit misunderstood because like we talked about, you said you felt like you were losing time right now. And I explained to you that your skin is not even going to start to thin out. You still have your baby skin, your thick baby skin. That's not going to, I mean, you have thinner skin genetically than normal people. So you already have that advantage, but it's going to get thinner. Yeah. So we're not even going to see the most detailed version of you. And there's nothing we can do about this until you age. Yeah. So but as growth as hormone you, would make the skin thicker in that oh, case. It makes it worse. Absolutely. I don't let my guys, I don't let my classic guys use GH generally. Sometimes I will situationally, but generally, and for that reason, that's what's ruined open bodybuilding. And people don't realize that they're like, oh, these guys are not as detailed as the guys in the nineties. It's because they're big. It's because of so much food. No, it's the GH because GH uh upregulates collagen synthesis and that's what your skin is made up of so when you take high doses of gh which all the olympians do the open olympians your skin eventually gets thicker and that detail starts to disappear so you actually want to let your skin start thinning i was actually talking to nick walker about this the other day he said you know what i don't even want to use gh anymore he's like i feel like it ruins all the physiques and i said dude you're right like it does i was like you want to get in use it for whatever purpose you're using it for, which is typically to break genetic plateaus and then get out. And then your skin gets thinner. This is why the nineties guys and eighties guys were all more detailed because their skin got thin. So as far as your career, we're not even going to see the best version of your physique until your late twenties, early thirties. So if we were to get you there early now, you know, we would, you know, kind of be, you know, burning the candlestick at both ends, you know, like we don't want to, get you ready too early because we're going to miss that, that period that, where you're going to be at your best. That leads me to something that I'm, I'm genuinely curious about. Cause you know, we have a lot of guys that do put that pressure on themselves. So everybody wants to be the youngest pro, right? You know, everybody's so stuck on that. I want to be the youngest pro. And it's like, it's not going to happen. Like the it's most likely not even going to happen, but you see those guys, like, I don't know if you remember, like, I don't really want to like say names, but there was like a lot of guys that were big and upcoming, like they won T nationals back in the day and they look great at like 19, but then four years later, they look like shit and nobody ever hears about them again. Why do you think that happens? Those are guys that peak early. And here's the thing that early um, though, that's, that's so early to peak at like 19. And then you just can't have no career after that. Here's here, here's, here's the thing. Um, 
you only have so long of a shelf life, you know, as a, as a, as a top pro, I don't think anybody's going to be staying near the top for more than 10 years. It's because of the wear and tear on the body and the physique. And eventually it breaks down. So it doesn't matter if you get into it early or if you get into it late, like uh, Luke Carroll right now, uh, one of my guys, IFBB pro, he's 38 years old. But the thing is he didn't push hard until he was like 30. He's still relatively, even though he's 38, he's still relatively fresh, but now he's getting his old man skin, his thin skin, all the details coming in. He's still got his fullness. So if you were to guess his age, you'd probably guess he was 30 years old, you know? Um, and then you've got guys that get in early, but guess what? If you turn pro at 20, you're probably not going to be competing past 30, 32. You know what I'm saying? If you're really at your, if you're really an advanced physique at 20, you're not going to be able to hold that for 10, 12 years, just the wear and tear. So it doesn't matter how early you turn pro. You're not going to be a pro. You're not going to be competing at the Olympia for 20 years. It's not going to happen, you know? So it doesn't really matter how early you get there. And there's no reward or award or any type of accolades for getting there first. Uh, you know, no. the people way think I look you're going to like, you're going to have this trophy because you're the youngest pro. Yeah, but dude, like, I look at it like this, dude, you turned pro, you turned pro at 20 years old. Okay. That means you've been juicing since you were like 17 and you disrupted your natural development. Probably not going to have kids. Your, 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 yeah. your, uh, your hormonal system is completely disrupted and fucked. You'll never recover. You'll be on TRT the rest of your life. Um, I just, and, and, and it, it, it affects your development. It, it affects your brain development, your neural development. It affects your physical development. All of those things by jumping on, before your body has completed, you know, puberty, for example. Now, somebody like you, I see a full beard and everything. You probably started puberty early. I yeah, you know? I had Whereas, I had facial hair when I was ten. No, dude, I didn't. I I I didn't start puberty till I was twelve. That's so why people say, you know, I post videos when I was fourteen. I'm repping two two twenty five on bench because I started working out when I was thirteen. They're like, yeah, you were definitely on gear. And it's like, I think I worked out and I probably just hit puberty early. Like I was able to build muscle at that age great for facial hair like this until i was 23 or 24 wow yeah so i was i was a late bloomer you know so had i you know disrupted my system early i'd have been screwed whereas you probably finished puberty a little early so you know you weren't in as much danger you know and now you've got these kids 16 17 18 just dying to jump on cycle and when kids come to me and they're that age i, I tell them i'm like i'm not putting you on your first cycle right now. I won't do it. You can find yeah. another coach or you can listen to me and we can build natural. I had a kid that just worked with me for 18 months and now he's, you know, he's finally turned, well, he's turned 20 and then we waited like another six or eight months. And then we finally said, okay, let's do it. You know, but they're, they're ruining themselves by doing that. So if I see a 20 year old pro, I'm immediately thinking you fucked up. Yeah. Well, genetics are obviously a huge factor within that though, too. Cause then you have guys like, like look at Quentin when he was natural like a Chris, when he was 20 years old, you know, Chris was already fucking huge at 20. Like, and what is he, 27, 28 now? And he, he looks like almost Bumstead just as big when he was 20. Always been a hype. Chris Bumstead has always been hyper responsive as far as growing muscle. Yeah. You know, and, you know, you, I think he's a phenomenal physique, one of the best physiques ever, one of the best competitors on the planet. Open class, it doesn't matter what division, he's one of the best bodybuilders that's ever lived. Um, but I don't think that he's necessarily someone you need to listen to as far as how to lift and how to get big and how to get in shape because he's never had a hard time with it. You know, well, it I kind think, of happened. I think people see like him at 20 and think, you know, I need to get to there when I'm 20 and realize like that he's just such a genetic outlier. Like these are all these kids trying to push all this gear to like, you know, get to that level by 21 to go pro and they just end up fucking here's, themselves. Here's the thing about Chris. Um, I don't know Chris Bumstead. We have never had a conversation, but I know a lot of people that do know him and know about him. And I believe that he's a very honest and good hearted, genuine person. He's a great champion. He's a great ambassador for our sport. He encompasses everything. You know, I'd like to see him be a little more outgoing and sharing, but he encompasses everything that we'd want for somebody that represents our sport. You know, he's, he's a phenomenal role model, but you, but you got to understand he's hyper responsive. He has genetic health issues. He can't take take a lot of gear so he yeah. got that big without even having to blast whereas mm -hmm. most other 20 year olds if they think they're going to get to that size they're going to take four times what he took and probably still not get that big you know mm -hmm. yeah so you can't really follow what he did he's an outlier and not only that he's got this genetic structure that makes him look bigger than he is his muscles jump you have that too well, you know well. whereas you know, other people, like, for example, like myself, I never had shape to my legs. And I've, I've given this lesson a million times over. 
So in order for my legs to appear like they had shape, I had to build more muscle. And by the time my legs looked like they had had shape to them, they were 30 inches, you yeah. know, like, like, I, like I'm, I'm pretty sure your legs aren't close to 30 inches, but they look big. My legs, when they probably measured what your legs measured, look tiny. They look terrible. You know, so you know, that's another lesson for these listeners that when you don't have shape in a body part, it's got to be excessively bigger to have the appearance of shape. And that's why sometimes people can't make the classic limits, because by the time you look classic, you know, or that you have enough size for the muscle to pop and jump off the bone and have the right impression, you're too heavy. You know, um, I would have struggled with that. Um, people all say that I would have been a classic Olympian and I would have. Class, you have to have the, the perfect genetics for it, the perfect structure and everything. It's all but about. I was yeah. by the time I had that look, I was pretty heavy. My legs you know, were even, twenty six and a half. What is it? Twenty six and a half. Those are my legs. Yeah. And 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 I made a and again, Luke Carroll, my, uh, one of my IFBB pros, open bodybuilder. We we made this post last year. Um, I posted a picture of my legs next to his, and I said, "Whose legs look bigger?" And everybody said, "Looks pretty much the same." I said, "Oh, really?" Because my legs four inches bigger than his. And I said, "Now why?" And I posted another video of us both measuring our kneecaps. His kneecap was fourteen inches. Mine was seventeen. <laughs> so because my joint was three inches bigger. It made our legs look comparable, even though my leg was four inches bigger. So now imagine what his leg would look like when it was the same measurement as mine. It would look insane. Yeah. You know, so it's all about, you know, the illusion and the genetics that people don't realize. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Chris is a big fucking you. I see Chris. I know Chris. You know, he goes to the same gym. I talked to him at the warehouse. You know, he's just a big fucking human. He's like six one. Very you know? strong, too. It's very yeah, strong. Very he strong. Also, he. He's got a system down for what he does, and he does a lot of things that I think are great that people just seem not to pick up on. You know, nobody picks up on the fact that every time he gets back to bodybuilding, he spends a period reactivating his muscles, priming his system, making what I'm sure doing right now. that yeah. everything is firing and balanced. You know, he sets the stage before he starts bulking, and people don't do that. And I think that's a very, very intelligent approach. You know, make sure everything is firing properly in proper sequence and so, everything is balanced and there's no issues before you start moving up. I want to I want to touch on that real quick because people are going to listen to this. And a lot of people have asked me this before. What exactly do you mean when you say a muscle is firing or when you get to the point of a workout where it's like my quads are no longer firing? How do you test that? How do you know that? You know, what does that exactly mean? Well, basically, the, 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 the scientific term is called potentiation, which basically means turning on, activating. Now, everybody has done this, um, and I'm going to give a, a clear example that I'm sure everybody in this entire, that's watching this has done. You've walked into the gym, and you've put 135 on flat bench, and you did 10 reps. Now, if you were mindful, you recognized how that felt. If you waited two more minutes and you jump back under 135 again, all of a sudden, it feels like it's half the weight. It feels 10 times lighter than the first set. And the reason for that is, is because of nervous system activation. It's called potentiation. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't do this properly. I have three videos on my YouTube that'll walk you through this process. But yeah. it's essentially activating the muscle and getting them to fire properly so that you can actually bring out the most motor units and get the most stimulation and lift the most weight and grow the most muscle that you possibly can. So... You know, as you as your peer, the reason why we pyramid up in weight when we haven't got to our working sets yet is because we're constantly we're priming, we're potentiating, mm -hmm. we're getting the nervous system firing. And I have, I've had, I've had countless people come lift with me, and it's always the same, same story, same answer, same quotes. You know, oh my God, I'm I'm so much stronger when I train with you. It must be the pressure. It's not the pressure. It's never the pressure. It might be a little bit of pressure, but it's the fact that we warmed up properly and we activated our muscles more. So I brought out more of your true potential. You have just never got your muscles firing as hard as they actually can fire. Yeah. And when muscles are really firing properly, it kind of feels like almost like a cramp is approaching, but it's not really a cramp. But you know, people know what a peak contraction is. They know what a solid contraction is. And you know when you could feel the muscle firing. Well, some people I'm think that's saying you should. Some people think that's an issue because I've, I've had clients where they're like, in this movement, it feels like, you know, I'm getting a cramp and I'm like, that's how it, it should feel. That's good. But like they, they're not used to it because beginners don't really have that that neurological connection. They're not used to it. So they all oh, something's wrong. You know, why do I feel that crampy tight feeling? You know, I, I need more potassium or something. But that's how well, this that's contraction. another that's another 
that's another thing that young kids typically don't learn uh, very quickly is how to activate their muscles. And it's, and it's another thing that's going to take time for people to develop. Yeah. Um, I, uh, one of my uh, apprentice coaches uh, is Kyle Wilkes. I'm sure a lot of the young listeners are familiar with him. He coaches a lot of big time influencers. Um, and I, I basically taught him how to be a coach over, over a, a number of years. And he's a great coach. But I remember when we used to train, he would ask me how long before I could fire my muscles off like you. He was expecting me to say a couple of workouts, a couple of weeks. It takes years for your nervous system to develop to the point where you could fire it off like that. Some people uniquely have that natural inclination and genetic ability, probably like Chris, um, whereas it's harder for other people. And I've I've found, you know, through researching and through trial and error and, and serving and talking to people that hyper responsive body parts for people are actually body parts they connect better with. Yeah. Um, I, the first time I, I figured this out, I was talking to Darren Dudash, old time bodybuilder. Uh, he uh, competed with Phil Heath at the junior junior nationals, but he had these huge legs. I remember him telling me because I was asking him, he said, I could, he said he could squat 500 pounds. But he said, when I'm doing 225, I do 10 reps. My legs are on fire. Now, my only hyper responsive body part is my shoulders. And when I train shoulders, they're on fire. It, the workout's like torture because the pain doesn't go away the whole workout. I can intensely feel them with a five pound dumbbell. And yeah. you'll commonly see body parts that don't grow, you can't really feel. And the body parts that grow really well, you're very, you feel a lot. I, uh, you know, one that stood out to me was when I was uh, training Rami in 2015. I trained him for a couple workouts. And I just remember he's warming up with 135 on incline and, 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 I'm, and he's like grimacing. And I'm like, does that, you know, does that hurt? Yeah. Like he could, it, now mind you, he went up to four, 400, 450, but even at one plate per side, he really felt that contraction. Same thing. We were hack squatting. He did like three reps with one plate and I could see him grimacing already. And yeah. for him, it was an intense contraction. It was a bit, it was a lot of burn, a lot of pain. And the people that tend to connect to their body parts, like I'm sure your biceps are like this, you know, you could probably curl a soda can and get a fucking contraction. Right. Yeah. And, and that's how you can really tell body parts that can grow. And that's how we fix body parts that can't grow or don't grow is we spend more time on those body parts um, connecting. A lot of times people will see like old time methods, like if if their chest won't grow or they're having a hard time or they really want their chest to go, what do they do? They benched every day, right? Um, now that may not have worked for a long period of time. And then all of a sudden their chest starts growing. Why? It's because their chest got contractions every day and so much stimulus. Eventually it developed to the, the correct neural connection to stimulate the muscle to the way we need it to grow. You know, so they kind of accidentally got that right. They might've overtrained a little bit, but eventually it played out in their favor. Well, this all plays into, you know, cause now we're in this huge generation of kids thinking they know more than they do and they all have the science-based shit and what comes with the science-based stuff even though this it isn't really even evidence-based stuff it's just people misinterpreting information not fully understanding is that them saying that my muscle connection and sensation doesn't matter when it absolutely does it's everything we're talking about right now because it's how you know you're training a muscle properly well here's the thing um sensation does matter and it doesn't matter because here's the thing context um, you're not going to be squeezing your pecs on your heaviest max effort set of pressing. If you're able to consciously think about that, squeezing the pecs and making sure you get a good contraction, then you're not going heavy enough. You're not going hard enough. But on the sets pyramiding up in your warm-up sets, you should be doing that. That's when you do it because you're programming what's called a motor unit recruitment firing pattern. So it's a sequence and intensity at which the muscles fire to accomplish a goal. So you're training that movement. And this is why it drives me nuts whenever people – They'll, they'll warm up on like a flat press and they'll pyramid up and then they'll go to incline and automatically jump to their top set. No, you're doing a different movement now. It's a different movement pattern. You need to reprogram that in order to be efficient. So you should start from the bottom and pyramid up on every exercise. Every time you change exercises, you need to pyramid again. You need to warm up again and you need to, you know, go up slowly and make sure everything is working properly again. Yeah, I always do that. Because it's a new movement. Yeah, I'll never a go. A lot of people don't do that. Yeah, I never go into a new workout just straight into the working sets. There's always at least one one warm-up set going into that before just to make sure everything feels good. But what I will do before all my workouts is typically like activation rounds where I'll take like two to three exercises. Like if I'm doing chest, I'll just do like cable flies, you know, cable press and just lightweight just to make sure I'm getting a good contraction, just blood flow. It's not anything fatiguing at all. It's just, you know, making sure everything's firing. But then what would you say at the point where people – 
in a workout when they know that the muscle is not firing anymore? You know, how do you test that if your quads aren't firing anymore? Because, you know, there's a point in the workout where it gets to do doing junk volume. And we could tell of, that a lot of this, a lot of this comes from experience, honestly. Yeah. So, it, you know, kid, and, and, and I get it. Listen, I was a kid once. I still remember how I thought. I still remember that I thought I knew it all. And, and you're very anxious and, you know, you just want to get moving and you just want to have all the information now, but it's not going to happen. And you have to just learn to accept that, but it's going to take time to learn these yeah. things. And eventually you're going to learn how a contraction should feel what a pump feels like, what an extreme pump feels like. And you should know when a muscle is no longer firing, it's done. You know, yeah. there's no more you can do. You're just going to beat a dead horse, deplete more resources and make it even more difficult to, to recover from that workout. So, you know, at some point when it doesn't feel like the pump is really good, when your strength is gone, when there's no contraction, go yeah. home. It doesn't matter what's left on your program. Go home. You're yeah. done. Call it like dead chest. When you're just doing it, you just feel like, like nothing's even there. Like what am I even doing? Well, this is where a lot of patellar tendonitis comes from because people's quads are not firing anymore, but they're still trying to push the weight. And what that does now is place a lot of tension on the tendon when the muscle's not supporting and shortening and lengthening properly. And it's not supporting the load, but they're trying to force it anyway. And that's what ends up causing that, that tendon to inflame and starts causing all their quote unquote knee problems. They did it to themselves. I'm not sure if it was you who said it, but there was like something that you did to say to test if your quads aren't firing anymore at the workout, like doing like a wall sit or something like that. Or was that you? Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, I'm not exactly sure if that was me. A lot of times my, my theories and, and ideas are, are, are ever changing. You know, sometimes things are in the moment. This is going to happen to you throughout your career. Yeah. You're going to have certain things that you did at this point and then later, but yeah, I mean, you could, if, 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 if it feels like a dull contraction, if it feels almost numb, and there's no more vascularity there and the pump is going down and the muscles kind of flat. The lines are gone. The quads are done, buddy, you know, and it's going to take some time to, to really get in touch with your, your body and really learn how this works. Because if you can't fire off a muscle properly to the proper intensity and you can't get a pump, which is metabolic stress, then you're not doing anything beneficial to grow at that point. All you're doing is burning calories and pushing yourself deeper into a hole that you can't recover from. Well, people say metabolic stress doesn't matter at all. Well, I don't know who says that, but we have a lot of uh, research and support and experience that proves that it does, simply because we could think in terms of the simplest logical explanations possible. Think about what we do know. Okay. When we're lifting heavy weight, um, we're not really depleting our energy system, right? We're, we're, we're focused more on tensile strength and activation, right? So your body is going to hypertrophy. Your, 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 your mu actual muscle fibers are going to increase in size. Now, if we were to do a more endurance based um, exercise, why would our body not adapt its capabilities towards endurance? Well, we know it does. We, when we, want to run a marathon or we want to run long distance eventually we get better you better at using oxygen right it's called elevating your anaerobic threshold um so if we push ourselves into a place or a, a range or situation where we're requiring more energy our body is going to adapt in that manner it's going to increase the amount of um uh i would say nutrients or um uh, resources within the sarcoplasm, right? And that's where sar sarcoplasmic hypertrophy comes from. And we we see this all the time. And you could see this with different physiques. Like Branch Warren was not a high rep guy. So if you ever looked at Branch Warren's physique, flat versus full, there was very little difference because he didn't have a lot of sarcoplasmic volume. It was purely myofibril. He was dense. He was hard, but he didn't look incredibly like round and puffy, right? So he didn't have much variance, whereas you might see other people where flat versus full, like, for example, I always trained very high volume. If you saw me without a pump, I don't look like I win, I can win a local show. If you see me with a pump, now I look like I'm almost a pro. You say and that's high... because my circle volume has that much of that much change. And, and that's how much uh, my muscles can actually fill out with with glycogen and water. You say uh, high volume, when you're talking about training high volume, but within that volume that you're accounting for, is that all to failure? Or when I say that... high volume, I mean more sets, more reps, you know, things like that. But um, are those it's, always it's... going to like absolute failure within that, you know? 
sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. What's important is that you always push your body to the brink of your capabilities, right? So if you're continuing, like, listen, we've seen this. We've seen this with what we do. If I start working into a 12 to 15 rep range, eventually my muscular endurance gets better. How do we think that yes. happens? It's not the muscle getting stronger. Uh, to an extent, it's getting stronger. So it's handling the weight a little easier. But um, you could see people that don't get much stronger, but then they can get a lot more reps. So what's going on? Uh, you're increasing your sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, the amount yeah. of glycogen that you can hold. Yeah. And 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 that's exactly what the adaptation is. So you saw my 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 post the other day about you know science science being misinterpreted. We had a conversation about this. Yeah. Um, and you know, a gist for the listeners here is you know I basically said. I kind of mocked scientists, you know, like a scientist would say, oh, this is an exercise. That's great. I said, oh, great. How many people got big doing this exercise? None. But the research is heavily supported. Oh, awesome. Well, how many people in the uh, research project got huge from doing this? None. But it's supported by really, really intelligent, incredible scientists. Awesome. How many of those scientists got huge from this exercise? None. Okay. Well, that's bro science, you know, so- it's not the science is that the, the research is not even being done on our demographics. How can people say that that doesn't happen? Yeah. Well, the people who regurgitate, I think it's more so the people who regurgitate that information that are like very dogmatic about it. They get into these camps. Cause like you talk to like actual scientists, they understand the nuance within it. Like you like, like I've heard like Schoenfield talk and like, you know, I think it's Schoenfeld, right? Uh, Brad. Everybody sent me that post the other day that he made right after mine. What do you, I didn't even see. What do you post? I actually referenced this in the comments and um, he actually reposted this because he posted a very old article from like Flex Flex magazine or something. It was about training your outer pecs or inner pecs. And then up until a couple of years ago, everybody was saying, oh, you can't emphasize or bias one end of a muscle or another. You can't peak a bicep. There is no outer chest. There is no inner chest. And they had all their, their science supporting it. And this is what I really don't like about the evidence-based science crowd people that are just stuck in pigeonholed in that is the fact that when they're wrong they don't admit they were wrong and they talk down to you very pompously because they have literature to back it up and they can't understand anything outside of what's well, presented they think they have literature value. backing it up but the but the literature was 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 flawed or incomplete because what we found recently is you can bias one end or the other now you know you can uh, create more growth on one end of the muscle or the other, you know, based on angles and tension and muscle length and things like that. So now that research that all of those research, those uh, science-based people that were mocking everybody else and making fun of them, they ended up being wrong. And I don't hear any of them admitting it and apologizing. Wait, so Schoenfeld posted that, that you can do that. Absolutely. Well, he put, well, I mean, this that. research has been out now for a couple of years at least, but yes, he referenced that to basically show that, we got this wrong, you know. The the all of the science that we thought proved this beyond a shadow of a doubt was missing something. It was flawed. Yeah. It was wrong because now we know we can, you know. So you know, it, it, it the people that really latch onto science and and abandon, you know, anecdote and what we see in logic is, you know, it, it's it's ignorant. It's causing a problem and it's causing a lot of misinformation. And it's educating the younger crowd wrong. I spend 50% of my time with my clients disproving something they read online. And yeah. I tell my guys, please don't read online. It's There's so much bad information and it's not policed that it'll literally have you convinced that you're sure of something that's completely not right. They'll send me a TikTok. They'll be like, hey, why am I doing a set of 15 reps if there's no point of ever going like above six reps? And I'm like, what? <laughs> I don't believe that. I don't believe in that at all because you have different types of adaptation, you know, a yeah. cross between uh, myofibril hypertrophy and sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Yeah. You're going to have a mix of both and you're going to need a mix of both because, you know, you have different things to stimulate, like localized growth factor, stretching out the fascial tissue, which again, people try to combat that too and say that that's not possible because the fascial tissue is too oh, strong. FSC7? Well, I've, I've watched it happen. Okay. So the people that say you can't change the shape of a muscle and you can't affect this and that, listen, they've never worked with SEO and watched a flat bicep become a peaked bicep when the oil's gone, you know, like uh, it literally changed the shape of it. I've watched it happen. So, you know, people, they, 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 they're stuck. I, th I guess they're just stuck in their ways and they feel superior to you because they're science and you're not, but a lot of times they end up being wrong. And, but even you know, what you say, like, yeah, like John Meadows, like, you, you know, what do you say? Um, 
I'm glad right, I didn't wait I'm for I'm glad this. I didn't wait to try things and figure things out on my own before science proved it. Yeah. But the thing is, all of this stuff is what people don't understand. It's rooted in science. It's just understanding the mechanisms of it. But because there's not a study that specifically has this outcome to prove your point, it just is labeled as bro science. And bro you science just that. has I... yeah, it's just become bro science just become basically what people don't understand. It's what it is. I said that in the post as well. I said, listen, I am not saying that science is wrong. I'm saying that we don't understand it yet. Like we just don't have the information to prove it right now. It doesn't mean that something magical is happening and something mystical is happening and it's against science. It, nothing is against science. Science rules all. But just because we can't prove something or we don't understand something thoroughly doesn't mean that it's not true. Yeah, yeah. And real, so the back to the point I was making is that Real scientists like Brad, like they understand that and they'll say that and they say, you know, this is the outcome of this study. But, you know, this doesn't really mean that this is the end all be all answer. Reasons, what you'll notice, what you'll notice is the guys that are really in the field like Brad um, are they're guys who have done it. They've gotten big. They've been in the situation where they respect antidote and they know that they've seen things already that science necessarily hasn't proven yet. They're not the pompous guys. They're the open-minded guys. Usually yeah. the closed-minded, pompous science guys that talk down to everybody else as if they're inferior are the guys that have never actually gotten big or never gotten anybody big. And they don't train very hard and they've never done anything with their physiques. And, and yet they want to talk like like they're superior whereas people like brad he he's got enough experience to understand that science the the, the science that we have it still misses a lot and he yeah. understands that he understands that he could be wrong you know back in 2013 or 2014 i got annihilated online by all the know-it-alls telling me i rest too long between sets because you don't train like a bodybuilder, you're resting too long. Uh, you're and not now that's what everybody does. You're, and no, well, the research came out in 2017 that showed that longer rest periods are superior. See, in my mind, it was simple because I put the logic together. Yeah. If I'm starting a set, oxygen depleted. Well, my body's going to run out of oxygen before I hit muscular failure, and if that happens, my set's done. Yeah. You know, so why would I jump into a set of squats, huffing and puffing when it's already going to be hard to begin with? So yeah. it made sense to me, try to return to baseline and go into the set fresh so that I could get my best set out. Because what we, because we know that if you don't constantly have progressive overload, and I don't want to confuse your listeners, progressive overload doesn't just mean weight. Progressive overload can be reps. It could be the same set and reps uh, and weight and reps with better form, with better tempo, with better control, anything better than what you've previously done in any way is progressive overload. So keep that in mind when I say progressive overload. But, you know, people just get too stuck into certain ideas and, you know, they miss the forest for the trees or they just don't have the en enough experience to analyze, you know, the entire situation. And, you know, that's, that's generally a problem. But in my mind, going to the set fresh, and being able to perform my absolute best was what made sense to me. And I learned that by watching power lifters, yeah. you know, and, and I ended up being right. And guess what? I still haven't gotten an apology from probably hundreds of people that attacked me and told me I was stupid and I was a dumb, ignorant kid and I'm not a good bodybuilder. And I don't know what I, what I'm talking about. Mind you, I placed third at the USA in heavyweight bodybuilding when bodybuilding was still tough a year later, <laughs> but like, all these people attacked the living shit out of me and I ended up being right. And it's like a running joke now that I'm always ahead of science. And it's not that I'm ahead of science. I, I, I pay attention and people don't realize that theory and hypotheses always come from trial and error first. You know, we don't yeah. just guess, Hey, let's try to, let's try to figure this out. No, you usually have a lead and a hint on something and you're trying to figure out something specific from something you've experienced or seen. Like this is always happening whenever I do this. So let's figure out why that's how science works. You know, it's not just like, let me guess about something fucking random that I've never experienced or tried before. Um, and they they're typically abandoning all those things. Um, and not only that, the science that we have almost never relates to our demographic. And a, a prime example uh, I think I gave also on the post was as we get bigger, it gets harder to put on more muscle, right? Yeah. So the bigger you get, the harder it is to add new mass because you're further beyond your genetic set point and where your body wants to be. Well, if I have a study of people that have been lifting for 
two years or three years or or didn't really develop their physique to a significant extent. And I have a bunch of hyper muscular people in the other study. Well, I'm going to get two different results. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So if you're not using the exact demographic in the situation that you're in, then the results could vary and it might not even apply to what you think it applies to. Um, so that I'm not, I'm not ripping on science. I love science. I love to learn from science and it helps us out a lot. What I'm saying is don't take science or what we think we know right now is absolute law because a lot of times it's wrong and that's what most of these influencers are doing i see it all over tiktok all over tiktok these pompous people citing research and things without any type of interpretation or experience whatsoever yeah. um, and if you don't have a a, a a pretty good physique then then why am i listening to you you know would you go to a financial advisor who's broke yeah I wouldn't. no no people hate people hate hearing that but it's true it's like if you look worse than me, you don't have the experience. Like, why the fuck should anybody listen to you? And like, obviously, there's there's exceptions to the rule when somebody's like, you know, 35, 40, and they've been doing, they've been a coach for fucking two decades. Like, there's exceptions, but like, the kids on TikTok are not the exception. You know what? It's it, it's crazy because, like, I don't know if you remember the barbell row argument, right? Yeah. Yes, I get that barbell rows are not an optimal, perfect, stable exercise for back. But you know what they do? What it does do? It forces more activation. It forces more work. It forces more intensity because it's a harder movement. And you know who does barbell rows? Ronnie Coleman did barbell rows. You know who else did barbell rows? Dorian Yates. You know who does barbell rows? Chris Bumstead. Yes, I'm talking about the elite, but there's a lot of people who are not elite that built their backs. But I mean, it's just logic. It's just too. logic. And people throw logic out the window. They only think, you know, well, this isn't the best exercise to, you know, bias my lats. That it's and like logic. That's... I think that I think that they're just listening to other people and letting other people form their opinions for them. And that's a yeah. big problem in today's society. You know, a lot of m mainstream news and media, people just quote what they heard, you know, like, oh, well, this is true. This happened. How do you know? Oh, th th this news station said it you're taking somebody at their word. Like they could be lying. They could be wrong. They could be misinterpreting. We see that all the time. And these, they just don't know how to think for themselves. Exactly. Those people just lack critical thinking abilities. And I guess, yeah, that does apply to everything. You know, somebody like that example, somebody would be like, well, this isn't the best exercise for your upper back, your lats. And like, yeah, like from a literature standpoint, yeah, like that's true. But like the reason why you're doing it is because you're fucking small and you need foundation everywhere. And it's going to have more well, this, yeah. stimulus you know everywhere. You know what I hate? A... One arm diagonal row pull down is better for your lats than barbell rows. You know what? Maybe it is. But guess what? Why are you worried about your lats when you don't have a back period? Exactly. You know, but, but it doesn't, but it doesn't target your lats. It doesn't bias your lats. It doesn't isolate your lats. What the fuck do you care? You need you need every muscle in your back. Yeah. You know what? You should be doing the exercises that hit every muscle group before you worry about isolating a little area. You don't isolate an area until you need balance later. Uh -huh. You know, you don't, you know, you don't you don't you don't build a sculpture by you know putting little pieces together. You start with the big the the you know the full the you foundation know, of clay and then, and then, then you down. fucking yeah. yeah. So if you have no, you know, like somebody approached me in the gym once, oh, how do I target my upper chest? I was like, dude, just, just press heavy and get strong. But does it hit my upper chest? You don't have a chest at all. Why are you yeah. worried about your upper chest? Yeah. Yeah. You the chest and then you could worry about your upper chest. Maybe your upper chest will grow. You know, you just don't have a chest at all. You know, so these kids are like worried about optimal exercises and perfect exercises when they should be learning about intensity and how to train hard. Yeah. That's obviously going to take them further. I think obviously, I think honestly, like, somebody who's new worrying about that, even if they are, do we have proper execution and intensity? Like just taking those movements instead, like the optimal movements for your lats, instead of doing something a barbell row, it's going to, you know, have a worse result. You know, they're going to build less overall mass with that. They're trying to start with the little finite details rather than the foundation. Exactly. And, 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 and I, I'm, I'm a, listen, people forget, they don't remember. I've been doing this for decades I've gotten hundreds and hundreds of people big. I've literally watched this happen. I've seen how everything works. And, you know, if you guys know who I am, you know, my, my reputation is pretty good. So I'm pretty credible as far as what I've seen and interpreting what I've seen. And if you start with easy exercises, you're going to get lazy. You know, you're just, you're trying to find the easy way, you know, and, and it's going to make you lazy. What you need to learn how to do is the harder shit and push yourself first. First of all, likely you're young. You're not going to get injured unless your form is absolutely horrific, which it shouldn't be. So you should have basic ideas on good form, but you shouldn't be worrying about crazy exercise. My, my young kids that I get, 
they're on a very basic program. They do rack deads, they do pull-ups, they do dips, you know, they, they do dumbbell presses, you know, I don't have them doing anything crazy, you know, how do I hit my quad sweep? Well, let's build your legs so they don't look like sticks first, and then we'll worry about your quad sweep, you know? So if you're sitting here, like trying to isolate an area, can you, theoretically, can you actually do those isolated exercises hard? Yes, you can. But listen, we're talking about reality. You're typically not going to learn to work hard unless you're doing hard shit and learning how to push yourself through it. And I tell everybody this. I tell all my new guys this, but I get young kids. One of the first things I ask them is, can you get a good training partner? And that's going to make an immense difference. Yeah. And I even, I did this twice this week. Two of my guys that are net or new, they just don't train very hard. And I said to them, I need you to find a big guy in the gym who seems friendly and ask him to train with him for like a week. Have he, tell him you just want to, Learn how to train hard. That's it. And that's what I tell all of you kids watching this, listening to this. We all think we know how to train hard. There's nobody that's listening to this right now that would look at me, look me in the face and said, you know what? I don't train that hard. Everybody thinks they do because they don't know that there's yeah. another gear and another yeah. level until somebody shows them. Well, I have so no what idea. You need <laughs> is somebody who can actually show you how to train hard. And now, now you are more aware of how hard you possibly can train. And now it's your responsibility to uphold that level. Well, they're also so afraid of fatigue now too. You know, I, that's the big thing. You know, it's going to build too much fatigue. If I do squats, too much fatigue. And they don't understand, like there's a shit ton of stimulus that comes with that. Well, you know what? I, I feel bad for a lot of the kids coming up in this now because the world is putting people at a habitual disadvantage. If if I wanted If I wanted to watch a movie when I was young, I had to go drive down the street to Blockbuster and walk in and pull it off the shelf. And, you know, I couldn't just push some buttons on TV and get it. If I wanted information, I had to go to the library. I couldn't just fucking hit Google sitting on my couch. Yes. Yeah, so people... they're getting laziness embedded in them by society. And 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 it, what it makes them do is it makes them avoid hard work that people you'll, you, and listen, you'll read this in every self-help books, every self-improvement book. Comfort is the fucking enemy. When mm -hmm. you get comfortable, your dreams will die. Mm -hmm. If you get comfortable, you're never, you have to learn to like being uncomfortable if you want to constantly progress. If you're and comfortable, plus, you're not pushing yourself. If you're not pushing yourself, you're not progressing. Plus everything, plus the training, plus it's just overall life and success, you know, just go plus everything. But yeah, I mean, when people I was, just, when I, when... people just have super short attention spans. You know, even on my fucking TikToks, I talked about, you know, a short thing on volume was just clip it's of a YouTube video. And he was like trying to argue with me. And I was like, listen, there's a whole 30 minute video where I go into death and you can watch this. And he's like, I'm not wasting my time with a 30 minute video when you could summarize it right now. And I was like, the reason there's a 30 minute video is because I can't fucking summarize it in a fucking 30, 30 word text caption. Like, and they don't want to take the time to learn. I posted, I posted a link to Dante Trudel, an article he wrote the other day on my story. And, and I, I don't know if you read it, but if you read it, what did I write? If you're too lazy to go and read this, then from somebody of his stature and his reputation, one of my mentors, then I question how much you actually care about what you're trying to do here. You know, if you're, if you're being lazy and trying to find shortcuts and the quick way out, you're never going to succeed. I remember 2000, um, 2018 was a year that I showed up like inside out fucking peeled, like Sean Roden inboxed me. Mr. Olympia at the time was like, what the fuck did you do? You know, like everybody was impressed. The thing was, I realized that I had gotten lazy at that point. So I started putting safeguards in my life to make me become unlazy. For example, I, I lived in a building in, in New Jersey and I was on the 20th floor. When I finished my cardio in the morning, I didn't take the elevator. I walked up the stairs just as a way of saying to myself, you're not, this is not going to be easy. You're not going to be lazy. You're, you're, this is not going to be easy way out. When I took phone calls with clients, I walked around my island. I did not let myself. And, I, and to this day, I do the same thing. If you're talking to me on the phone, I'm not sitting down. I don't yeah. allow myself to sit while I'm on the phone. I stand up. I walk around and in prep, when I'm in contest prep, I get a standing desk and I do all my, all my client work and laptop work standing all day. And that's just to teach yourself. It's just a way of saying, don't be lazy, you know, do the extras, do what's necessary. And a lot of kids just don't know how to do that. And it's not really their fault. And, and a lot of kids think it's their fault. They think that they're incapable. You're not incapable. You've just programmed yourself the wrong way and you could fix it, but it's not going to just be a snap decision. Like, Oh, I'm going to stop being lazy. No, it's something you've got to practice over and over and over and over and over until it stops. And it's just like any other habit. Just like when you first joined the gym, first 10, 10 days, two weeks, three weeks, month, it's going to suck. It's really going to fucking suck. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 
I started uh, working out again now after months off. And guess what? I feel like fucking hell. I almost threw up the first day from doing nothing. So doing I, I, almost nothing. Threw, I almost threw up from two fucking chest exercises the first day back. Oh, you know what? Yeah, it's always hard when you start. It's always hard when you're trying to build a new habit. So if you're if you're at a pattern of being lazy and you start to make yourself become unlazy, you're going to be pep talking yourself every fucking time. But you know what? The more you talk to yourself, the less likely you are to do it. Get up and fucking do it. Don't think. I That's remember like, yeah. Juan Morel. Juan Morel, bodybuilding, a bodybuilder, Olympian, phenomenal bodybuilder, won lots of shows. Juan Diesel. I remember him telling me, when my alarm clock goes off in the morning, I don't hit snooze. If I've got to do something, I do it. If I think about it, I'm not going to do it. He said, yeah. there's no there's no bargain here. There's no discussion. If I've got to do something, it's done. Like you I program it, yourself. In my mind, it's already done. If it's time to eat, I'm eating. I don't care how I feel. I don't care. I'm eating. If my alarm clock goes off, I'm up. I don't lay there for a second. I don't roll over. I open my fucking eyes, roll over, and get out of bed. And that's it. Yeah. And that's a pro champion mindset. And he was a champion, you know? Yeah. And that's because of that mindset. You know, a lot yeah. of people can't do that you know if you ask nick walker if he's ever missed a meal what the fuck are you talking about yeah like that's not an option to him yeah people don't realize how much mentality plays into this i mean at least if you're trying to pursue bodybuilding and actually go far with it even if it, even if you're not competing if you're just somebody who wants to maximize your progress and you're going there you don't want to waste your time like you need to have the right mindset going into it and that obviously carries over to, you know how you execute your your training well, well, yeah, but you know what? It's a great story is uh, Hani Rambod, for example. Um, I respect what he said immensely because I think he said it a couple of years ago because people asked him what he does special as a coach. And his Cycle. answer was honest. It was very honest. He said, I'm not, I'm, I don't do anything special with diet and training and drugs. Like if you're looking for like a super secret special program, that's not me. He said, my skill is connecting with people and and getting them to do the right things and getting them on the right mindset. And that's why you'll see Honey, take somebody who previously wasn't doing good and all of a sudden they're doing great. And everybody's like, oh, that must have been a great program. His drugs are up. His training's... That no, none of that is different. Honey fixed their fucking head and that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah, it's all you know, like and he's and he's and he's the best at that. He's and he says that. He's like, I'm the best at getting people to do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. And it's as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. It's very psychological. Like when I started training, I was fortunate enough to have a mentor, a guy who was like my age now. And he would pick me up, bring me to the gym with him. And he trained like a fucking animal, like branch war. And like, and it's like shit I would never do now. You know, we would do like sets of 20 reps You're on lucky squats. lucky that you had somebody show you that early. Yeah. We would do like sets of 20 reps on squats with like those 60, 60 second rest. And he was a wrestler. Like he was adapt to it. You know, he had that endurance. I didn't. And he would put 225 on. When I get on. my wrestlers, I already know they're going to work. Yeah. He would put 225 on. I could barely do 225 for like five reps. And he would force me to do 20. And I would throw up. And like a minute would go by, he like, all right, another set. And I would never train like that, but that taught me the threshold of how hard you can really fucking train. And I know like anytime I do a, a, like a workout now, I still like remember back to like, is my intensity anywhere close to that? And you know what? You were very fortunate to have that, but a lot of kids don't have that. And yeah. they'd be very surprised. The big guy in the gym will likely take you under his wing if you ask. Now he's not going to train with you forever, but if you say, listen, being honest, I need to learn how to train hard. I just want to train with you for a week just so I could learn how to train hard. He'll probably say yes. And if he says no, the next guy will say yes. So everybody watching this, you think you can't, you, there, it, you absolutely can find somebody who's going to take you through a week of workouts, beat you to fucking hell okay. and show you that you're capable of a lot more than you think you are. A lot of times people don't get reps because they believe they can't. They've already defeated themselves in their mind. It was task filling, Whereas yeah. if I put a gun to your mother's head, you'd get that rep in two more. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it, it's just a matter of how much you care. What are you willing to endure? A lot of people don't have a good pain threshold. Now, I had that from wrestling when I was young, and I'm, I'm a little bit I, I think I'm a little bit mental in that aspect where I can I just I don't have that self-preservation fear in my head where I'm just willing to go. Like I passed out squatting four times. Yeah. Um, you know, I've done crazy things, but that mentality is what allowed me to push. Cause I don't, I don't, I don't have genetics like you. I couldn't grow like you. If I don't kill myself, I don't grow. And, and that's like that for a lot of people. You know, I, I got, I got, I got big, you know, I competed as a super heavyweight on the national level. People think that it was all genetics. I'm like, it took me fucking 
15 years to get there. What are you talking about? Like, yeah. I killed myself to get there. You know, they just see the end result. They don't see how you got there. Yeah. You know, but the, the take home here is you got to learn how to really push yourself. And almost everybody listening to this right now, you're thinking that you know how to push yourself. I promise you, you don't. don't. Every time I've ever trained with somebody, they like, they were just, they're, they were shocked. It was like, holy shit, what the fuck? Yeah. And it was because they learned that they had a new gear. And then I said, well, now, now you know where your roof is. Now you know where your ceiling is. It's a lot higher than you thought. But now it's up to you to keep that up. And that's why people, you know, they like trying to make fun of you. Like when I post a video of me training legs and I go on Hack Squad, I'm screaming. Like I'm literally like fighting for my fucking life. Like at that moment, it feels like I'm going to die. And people can't comprehend that in their mind, like the amount of intensity that I'm actually bringing. It's not even like fathomable to people, you know, the amount of pressure I'm putting myself under to get those reps. Like it's just people stay comfortable and they think they're training hard, but they're really so far away from it 99% of the time. I remember, uh, I remember training with one of my guys, national level competitor. His name was Mike Charles. Uh, he took third uh, nationals. He's a top 10 guy at North American, very good bodybuilder. He's one of uh, Sean Clarita's best friends. Um, he's just known for his intensity. And he used to say, it's hard to know when to spot you. And the reason why it's hard to know when to spot me is because I look like I'm struggling on rep one, even if I'm doing 20. And that's the problem. People don't lock in and execute each rep like it matters. You know, they're just thinking, okay, well, I'm going to keep going until it gets hard. And then I'm really going to work. Right. Whereas if I pick up a weight on rep one, you're going to be like, wait, should I spot him? Like you see me, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm driving the weight out, but I have a lot of control and my face looks like I'm struggling because I'm locked in and I'm intense and I'm focused, but I might get 12. I might get 15. So, and not only that, I lock in my form and my tempo so that all my reps look identical. So it's hard to know when to spot me. And, you know, I'll kind of like either like grunt or give an okay or like an eye gesture. Or sometimes you can see my bar speed slow down and that's when you know how to spot me. Yeah. But um, if you're really executing properly, like clients send me videos. I have, I'm one of the only coaches that does this. I have, a, I have my clients send me a lot of videos until I'm sure you're lifting the way I need you to lift. Because I realized long ago that a lot of the lack of progress and a lot of coaches struggle with this. You probably have struggled with this. You're just like, why every, this program is solid. Why is this motherfucker not growing? Like I, I wrote everything right. I'm positive this is right. Well, I, I have and, so many and, videos too. Yeah, and they're not growing. And then you see them train, and you're like, oh, that's why. I had a guy. I shit you not. I'll send you a screenshot. I'll cut, crop his name out. Who was squatting? Uh, it was I think it was like two forty five. Uh, two weeks ago, and I said to him, I said, dude, you're you're a lot stronger than that. You're you know, you, I said, don't take this wrong. You're not lifting hard. And he argued with me. This is impossible. I said, listen, I'm not here to argue. I'm here to coach you. You came to me because I know what I'm talking about. And I was, and then guess what? I got a video the next week, 315 for the same reps. Yeah. Yeah. It happens He's like, a lot. I guess I was always, a he said, I guess I was, always, and, and he didn't get stronger. He was just always capable of that. He just didn't know he was capable of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I sent him the videos from, from YouTube, basically showing how to warm up, prime, get things right. And how to get his mindset right. Keep things tighter, stay control, stay compact. And all of a sudden, he's massively stronger. And this is a lot of you guys listening right now that don't believe what I'm saying, that I promise you this is true, you know? Yeah. So, you know, this is something to be said for putting effort into every rep, every set. And, and, and you can go on my page and watch my videos and you'll see me look like I'm like, like I'm like I'm in hell. I'm, I'm rep one, but uh -huh. I keep going, you know, because every rep is locked in and you've got to learn how to make all those reps count. I want to go back to what you said about the sarcoplasmic hypertrophy because I talked to Paul about this. I talked to Jewett about it. There seems to not be like a lot of research on sarcoplasmic hypertrophy itself. But basically, oh. from my from my understanding of it, this is what I basically have gathered from like you know I guess like a meathead explanation is you know myofibrillar hypertrophy sarcoplasmic they're kind of like intertwined. You know I don't think I don't know if you could you well, either way you're going to be training for both. But more metabolic stress, higher reps will you know have more sarcoplasmic effects within that. So basically higher rep ranges, more metabolic stress can create that fuller, rounder look, more glycogen, make you have a better pump. Absolutely. And then listen, anybody who's done it will agree. Anybody yeah. who's competed to a high level of bodybuilding and has done all the various forms of training. And remember, I haven't just done it. I've coached hundreds, if not thousands of people. 
Mm-hmm. I've watched this process over and over. I've been in this 20 years. And what I've looked one of the things that I'd like to do is I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty well known and respected. So I can talk to almost all the pros, you know, all of them know me. I can talk to all the Mr. Olympias. I can talk to all the Olympians. And I'd like to survey people in certain situations and ask questions and see if I can find common ground, you know, see if I can figure out how they arrived at these certain things. And I've literally watched these things happen. You know, I've changed people's training styles and watched them become more volume, more volumized. Um, I've watched them do like a DC style training and, and have like a, a flatter, but denser, thicker appearance. And then there's not much variance, flat versus full. Uh, I remember 2017, I posted a picture, two pictures side by side. And I said, how long do you think of between these pictures? People were saying three months, six months, four weeks, things like that. I was like an hour because that's what I look like, flat versus full. Um, but I'm a very high volume trainer. Now, let me ask um, you this. My body. Let me ask you this. Okay. So when I look at the physiques in the eighties, the early nineties, you know, these guys, in my opinion, look significantly fucking better and they look like they got, you know, lean enough. I don't know if they were as conditioned, but you know, we know the major difference between those physiques have been like the use of insulin and growth hormone. Right. But also their training style was very different as well. So you think that's why they look so full and shit because they had more sarcoplastic hypertrophy within that. And now we have all these guys. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because I know the exact point in my career when I switched, when I switched that up and I know there's a drastic difference in my physique, not just the size of my muscles, but the look of my muscles, the shape of my muscles. And, and I've seen this across the board. Anybody who's really been a high level bodybuilder, will tell you that you can volumize a muscle. Anybody who's never done it, who's just stuck on research is going to tell you the opposite. Yeah. You know, um, now granted, there's going to be certain people that have done it that are just like, like I know John Jewett is a stickler to science. He's not going to agree with anything unless there's a paper that can prove it. Um, oh, no, no, no. And, he's he's and, open. I talked to him. He's, he's open-minded. He just, he talks no, listen, about the research, I, he, but he understands. He op- he's open-minded. He Listen, he's, he's very good bodybuilder, phenomenal bodybuilder, Olympian. He's done a lot with his career, um, phenomenal physique, um, gets in great shape, and he's very smart. Um, I, I'm not really familiar with a lot of the things that he he does, but from what people tell me, like he's really, really, really hooked on science and, and micromanaging things, you know? So like he does it his own way. But yes, I do believe that he's he's smart enough to know that he's not going to never do high reps, you know, or he's never going to try to push volume and stay full. Yeah, no, he um, does that. He told me he does. He just, just, just have more, because there might not be research supporting the sarcoplasmic thing, but it's just to have more tool belts in your fucking, you know, whatever to, you know, just, just even, even if it is true, but we don't have research just to do it anyways, because it's not going to hurt you. It's only going to ha- Yeah. Like I said, if, you know, just because science hasn't been able to prove it yet, doesn't make it untrue. Mm-hmm. You know? We don't know how black holes work, but we know they're there, you know? Okay. So, and we, we, we know some, we know some of their properties, even though we, we have no actual sampling of anything regarding them, you know, like, so just because something hasn't been proven, doesn't make it untrue. And like you said, Jew is smart enough to know that I'm going to at least try this. And I do see this, you know, if you, if you took, if you, if you ask Jew it, if he's not, if he's going to prep for a show and never do a high rep set, you know, because of science, he'd look at you like you're crazy. Yeah. You know, no. because people... he doesn't want to on the off chance that it is possible. He doesn't want to miss that, you know? So the people that generally say that that doesn't work are the people that have never competed at that level, worked with those type of athletes, seen those types of adaptations. You know, a lot of times, like you'll have a lot of respected coaches that are really, really good with mechanics and lifting and know the science but they worked with football players. They worked with basketball players. They worked with athletes. They worked with power lifters. They never actually worked with professional bodybuilders. And if they did, they worked with one, they worked with two, you know? So the P you'll never, you won't find a coach. You will not find a high level coach, Honey Rambod, Chris Aceto, you name them, Chad Nichols, that's going to tell you high reps don't work and you can't volumize a muscle. Not one of them is going to agree with that. Nobody. And these are the guys with the most experience and the most success with that exact topic so you think fsc7 i know fsc7 is just how he's like rebranded you know protocol to volumizing training you think that's a very very real thing it can very well work for bringing up a lagging muscle group one of one of the reasons it works is because it's honey rambot so because people believe it's going to work they're going to put more effort into psychological it, you know? yeah um another another thing is it's just it's just a structured a structured way 
that's giving it an identity and a process of volumizing a muscle. That's all it is. You know, Lee Priest made a funny joke about that years ago. He's like, wait a minute. So lift heavy at the beginning of my workout and then do high reps, short rest periods at the end to get a good pump. He's like, fuck, I invented this 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Because that's exactly what it is. It's just structured. But it's the same fucking thing. You drink enough water. You have enough electrolytes. You Short rest periods, high reps, burnout. It, you know, the, the number of reps don't matter. The rest, rest period doesn't matter. What matters is the intensity behind it. Yeah. You know? So I want to get into to some, some other things here. So you know, you obviously believe having a good pump within your training is important. Getting a good pump. Not the whole workout, but at some point, yes. So... With that being said, you know, pump can actually pump can actually impede strength. So I think at the beginning, when you're doing your heavy work, no, you shouldn't be looking for a pump. And we're look, but towards the, at some point in the workout, we're trying. To, we should have a pump for what specific reason? For volumizing that muscle, or what? For many different things, you know, byproduct buildup has showed to uh, increase um, in increase localized growth factor production, which we can't duplicate yet with science. So the only way we can do that is through tension or metabolic stress. That's one way. Uh, you've got fascial tissue stretching. You've got uh, different adaptations, uh, upregulation of transporters, uh, increasing insulin sensitivity. Um, you know, there's a number of different things that it does that's beneficial. But one of the best things that it does is the fact that it allows you to attack a muscle and stimulate the muscle in a different way. Once we have done our max effort sets, right, at the beginning, maybe one, two, three sets at the beginning of the workout, your, your strength is compromised for the rest of that workout. You're no longer going to break PRs. Nobody breaks PRs on their fourth working set. It doesn't happen. So now that you can't, you know, you can't beat what you've previously done in that way, but maybe you can in another way. Maybe you could do it in a 12 rep range. Maybe you do it in a 15 rep range because when you hit absolute failure, your body has to still kick on more motor units to accomplish the goal because the other ones have fatigued. So you're still going to get a good stimulus by going to failure. Obviously the best way is through muscular tension significant time under tension is king but there's other ways to do it because like i said after those first couple sets you're not going to be able to do it anymore so you've got to find another way so you're saying after that those first initial sets like let's say i'm doing incline press and then i'm doing a chest press machine i go to max failure to two top sets on those or whatever the rest of my workouts, I would still go to failure on those, even though they might be in a higher rep range. But you're saying you wouldn't even go to failure, ranges. but you're still going to go to well, failure. No, you would those. still go to failure just yeah. in higher rep ranges. Yeah, yeah. You change yeah. your rep range because you've got to understand the way the system works. Um, we are using very little fuel with a low rep range, right? Yeah. Whereas we're using a lot of fuel with a higher rep range. So, you know, there's different points of the anaerobic threshold that are changing fuel usage um, and, and, and things that are determining things like fatigue, for example. So um, just because I no longer have the nervous system activation and, and muscular capabilities and physical capabilities of hitting a max effort set in the six to eight rep range doesn't mean I can't break a PR in the 12 rep range or the 14 rep range because we've got diff different systems at work. Now it's not just top end strength, but it's strength, it's strength endurance. So now we've got a little bit of a mix. And then when you exhaust that, and then you move even closer towards endurance and away from strength, as your strength starts fading, you start moving a little bit faster pace and into a higher rep range and, and more time and attention and things like that. So we're getting various types of stimulus throughout the entire workout. Even if you look at DC training, which was the probably the first really advanced type of training that put enormous amounts of muscle on people. If you guys, if the listeners don't know, um, the author is Dante Trudel. He's on Instagram now. He just started writing blogs. He writes very long, comprehensive Imagine, posts, imagine he, he was on TikTok. He, oh my God. He, but he is the pioneer for a lot of things that we do today. He is the first coach that was known for jumping people over weight classes. And what I mean like that is middleweight one year, then over light heavy into heavyweight. So he was putting on massive amounts of muscle in people. And he did this with a, with a very, very um, particular system where you only train Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And you only did one max effort set per body part. But he also had a Widowmaker set. So what he did was one set was say rest pause was the intensifying technique you did six to eight reps. Well, you would rest three to four minutes so that you're back down, recovered, 
oxygen, normal. And then you would go for like a 20 rep set. And he called it the Widowmaker set. So even Dante, who was known for putting on more muscle on people than anybody in the history of our sport across the board, had high rep work in his low volume training. And it worked, worked phenomenally. He was also the first person to really mega dose protein. And, and, you know, like I said, back in the day, research have said that you can't absorb more than 30 to 30, 40, 35, 40 grams of, of protein per meal. Guess what? Bullshit. Bodybuilders have been going way over that forever, growing like crazy. And now recently research is saying, well, maybe you can absorb more than that. Of course you can. We've watched it fucking happen. Uh, it, it, you know, show me a pro bodybuilder who got big from eating low protein. Don't you, you're not going to find one. And if you do, there's, there's very few outliers. Some people really, really dependent on drugs or had great genetics. You know, there's always going to be an anomaly and an outlier, but the majority of pro bodybuilders, national level bodybuilders, the biggest guys all eat in the range of 1.5 grams of protein. You know, Kai Green, when Kai Green was at his biggest, he was known to eat two up pounds to even, of fish a meal. Yeah, up to even three grams. I've seen some I've seen some guys over 600 grams of protein. Well, well, Dante did push people up near 600 grams. Yeah. And it worked phenomenally. But how many people can eat that much? It's a lot of fuck. That's I think at that point, that's where we see the gut issues and stuff like that. You know, eating well, that much yeah, meat. That's yeah, a, well, that, that, that's, that's from eating a lot of food. You know, yeah. it's tough. to get. It, that's why it's so hard to get to Olympia size. And have a tight waist because of the amount of food you've got to eat. It's 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 a really really hard thing to do. The guys with the small waist on the pro level are the guys who went up slow. Yeah, you know the guys who got there fast do not have small waists. None of them. You know you see Sean yeah. Roden had a small waist. Um, you know my client Luke again has a small waist, but you know, none of those guys blew up overnight. Yeah, you know I mean the guys I have blow up overnight. Their waist blows up too. Yeah, I mean, I have a small waist, and I mean, obviously, I, like I'm not even a pro yet. I feel like you know, I'm. I don't want to sound like an asshole, but I feel like I could definitely stand against pros. But I've been doing this for ten I'm years. There's guys, guy, yeah. Well, there's guy. I've been doing this for ten years. You know, look at my waist. There's guys that have gotten twice my size in that ten years. You know, or even less. And obviously, you know, their waist is a lot bigger. Um, Listen, we could use a we could use a prime example again, Nick Walker. You know, uh, Nick's a good friend of mine. I, I, you know, I bring him up on these podcasts a lot because I'm familiar with the situation. Yeah. But Nick got big really fast. What was the main criticism? His stomach and his waist. Yeah. And he just spent the last two years, which is a phenomenal thing that he did because it's probably the first time in history that an open bodybuilder substantially improved and fixed their waistline. Or about Roly? Probably four. Not like Nick. Nick just probably pulled four or five inches off his waist. What did Rolly do? Not like that. Rolly's waist never looked the same again. Nick's waist actually starting to look small now and his taper looks great. Whereas he was straight up and down a couple of years ago because he got so big so fast, his waist grew along with it because of the food he had to eat. But now he acknowledged that he had to fix that. And, you know, it, it's a very hard thing to fix. But, you know, being the determined, phenomenal bodybuilder Nick is, he was able to do it. Most people wouldn't be able to fix that. Most people yeah. could. Ronnie couldn't fix it. Once he destroyed his waist, it was gone. Yeah. You know, Jay couldn't fix it. Once Jay's waist blew up, it was gone. You know, Phil Heath, once his waist blew up, it was gone. It's yeah. very hard to fix at that level and still hold your mess. So like Nick's diligence and determination is really something to be said, you know, but yeah, look how fast he blew up and look at what happened to his waist. And now he, thankfully he was able to walk it back, but most people can't. Yeah. Um, and when you see people grow at that rate, their waist grows too, you know, and it's just impatience. Yeah. This leads me into another thing I want to talk about. Let's talk about, you know, diet. What do you think? I know you don't, you don't track calories or macros, so, I mean, I'm not an advocate of if it fits your macros more so, you know, obviously just following a regimented diet, you know, what do you think the issues are within that for, I guess the demographic watching this mostly the guys getting into bodybuilding, uh, cause every, every, all, all bodybuilders are following a regimented diet at that point, but a lot of guys want to make the argument. I could just follow if it fits your macros and have all this flexibility within that. But then obviously we might have problems with digestion and whatnot. So what do you think about that? I don't like people to copy what I do because you would need my um, my knowledge and education and experience to do it the way I do it. I write plans by the meal. I'll walk myself through your day and I'll say, what does he need right now? And I'll consider all those variables. And I have almost um, a high functioning, like autistic ability where I can <laughs> analyze 
a yeah. million variables in a snap of a second. And I, I don't know why I can do that. It's just when I think about something, every variable just pops up in front of me and I'm instantly able to analyze it. Whereas a lot of people, I would have to like write it down and think it's like about that. Okay, we got to think about this. That. It's just for some reason with me, it just all pops into you my head. You ever see the movie like, Limitless? Yeah. It's like the numbers. That's what you're like. It's 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 more so like the people you'll see on YouTube, like the math mathematicians, like the the savants, will they'll say like like they'll ask them to multiply two ten digit numbers, and a number they don't know how they get to the answer. A number just pops in their head. It's not like they're sitting there trying to work it out. It just a number pops up. That that's that's how this worked for me. For some reason, I'm just able to analyze all the variables instantaneously. But I consider things like what did we train yesterday? How much are we trying to recover? How's digestion? What do I got to do today? What's my out? What are my energy levels like? What do yeah. I have to train today? What time am I training today? Um, how many nutrients? Like, so I go meal by meal, and then it's 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 interesting because if you go through my programs and you add up the macros, it would look like I specifically looked for those totals, but I didn't. I went meal by meal and walked myself through your day and decided what you needed at that point. But for anybody listening to this, I think that you should start with macro totals and walk and work backwards because that's what, you know, that's, what's going to be the, the simplest and most accurate for most people that are watching this to do, you know, you're not going to be able to do it the way I do it. It's what do you very, think? It's a very unique way that I do it. Well, do you think it's just going by those calories and macros or getting the calories and macros and then creating a diet to fit within that? Or do you think we should just go? Cause when you have just calories and macros, I think you should have reasonable totals that you target and then work that out. Like, for example, like a client will tell me, oh, the most carbs I've ever eaten questionnaire, for example, will say like 600 grams a day and my composition was pretty good. Okay, well, when I walk them through the day and when I walk myself through their day and I program meal by meal, it just happens to be around 600. But I didn't aim for 600. Whereas everybody else who's looking at this, you should pick a protein total, a carb total, a fat total. And then try to work that out, place it in the right places. You know, you want your carbs highest pre and post workout. The third place where carbs should be highest is breakfast. So breakfast pre and post workout is where I focus most. And then I filter carbs into the rest of the places. Now, pre-workout, I want an easily digested protein source. Post-workout, I want an easily digested protein source. Fats, I don't like to put through the day because it slows motility. It slows transit of everything through your system. So I bookend my days with fats. I put fats in the morning for breakfast and I put fats at bedtime. Well, exactly. That's what you I'm know, coming and to. And that's is, the way I like to structure things. Yeah, that's. But that's what I'm saying is when people follow if it fits your macros. What I see the typical biggest problem is these kids follow if it fits your macros, and they think I could just have all these choices to eat whatever. And what happens as a result of that is one inconsistency because they don't have a structured diet in place to look forward to, and then also they end up eating random things and it fucks with their digestion, which leads into you know no appetite, other problems. Rather than having you know I know my calories and macros, but these are the meals that I'm going to stick around. Maybe have you know tilapia instead of chicken this day you have these substitutions but i think having overall an overall structured diet is going to be much more conducive to just being to having better progress that fits your macros comes from the wrong place psychologically and behaviorally so if you follow it if it fits your macros it just means that you don't kind of have to be locked in sticking to something you want variety and if you and if that's where your mindset is you're already looking for the easiest most comfortable convenient way to do things and that mindset alone is not what's going to lead somebody to having a world class physique listen if you want to just lifestyle beach enjoy your life that's fine you know like nobody says you have to be a bodybuilder or a competitor um, nobody says that you have to have a world-class elite physique. If you're just doing this for yourself and to get girls and to look good and to feel healthy, if it, if it fits your macros, it's fine because you got to remember, we got to learn to follow something that's a lifestyle. You know, it's not a short-term thing. It's an everyday, all day for the rest of my life type thing. So they want that type of, of leniency and comfort. But if you're a competitor, you've got to have something structured to follow. If you don't follow a schedule and you don't follow something st structured, you're not going to be a good competitor. You are absolutely not going to be a good competitor. And then to your other point, yes, you're going to end up running into foods that disrupt your digestion. And that's a major thing that people don't realize is because mm -hmm. young kids typically don't have digestive disorders. My fiance works for some of the world's top GI doctors. She's a nurse. And she'll tell you straight up. She said to me one day, it kind of woke me up, made me think about this. If somebody comes into our office, she's like, there's no such thing as finding nothing. She said, "We will, if we do enough tests, we will always find something because as we age, just like everything else, just like our bones, just like our tendons, just like our ligaments, our hair, our skin, everything in the body goes through wear and tear and ages. So does your digestive tract. Eventually, your digestive tract is going to have problems. Now, I have colitis, for example, and she tells me, she said, listen, you've always had colitis. It's just when you were 
20 years old, you were probably, it only manifested to 5%. So you weren't seeing any side effects, but it was there. And then the way you ate exacerbated that and sped up the process. And then when I hit 32, you know, finally I started having trouble because now I was probably at 40%. You know, it was always there. It just wasn't bad enough for me to feel yet. And I ate so bad, I sped up the process where it probably wouldn't have hit me until 40, but it hit me 10 years early because I ate like complete shit. I ate a yeah. lot of processed sugar. I ate a lot of shitty fats and pizza and all kinds of crap like that. And, and I did it to myself. So a lot of these young kids, oh, well, I don't have a stomach ache. I don't have bloating. I don't have gas. That doesn't mean that you're processing everything properly. You yeah. know, it just means that you're very young and resilient. That's so what that means. Let's talk about why exactly gut health. Gut health is super overlooked within this sport. It's recently just become popular like in the past like year or two. Why is that so important? Why is digestion so important to, you know, making the most progress? Because what is poor digestion going to really lead to as long as you're eating the well, food? Well, gut health actually came in, gut health actually came in about 15 years ago from John Meadows. Um, but like a lot of people just didn't listen, you know, yeah. um, it's becoming more popular because a lot more people are talking about it now. But he did start that about 15 years ago. And he was the one that said, you not, it's not you are what you eat. It's you are what you process and digest and absorb. So if you're, first of all, we have to understand our, our digestive tract is what's getting us all the nutrients, all of those building blocks. It's what's facilitating recovery, you know? So think about it like this. You could have a construction site, right? And you could put a million of the world's elite fucking workers on there to, to put up a building. But if the road's blocked and the materials can't get there, you're not building shit. Yeah. So if you're not digesting and processing everything properly, you're not growing. You might eat 50 grams of protein. You're only going only to absorb 30% of it because your stomach's fucked up, you know? Well, how um, do you know? So if, if how do you know if you have, uh, you know, problems digesting? Like, how do you know if you're not digesting everything properly? A lot of times you're going to get symptoms. Things are going to manifest. And this is another thing with young guys that I've explained to people. Um, you're just not aware of things right now. Um, yeah. As you get older, you become more observant of the world and you become more aware. So a lot of side effects that young kids experience, you're moving so fast and there's so many things going on and your head's going so fast that you don't stop and notice these things. Many times in my, my in my career, I'm getting ready for a show and I see a divot somewhere. I see a body part shape that I don't like. Well, oh, fuck. Like, I remember thinking I tore the bottom of my pec. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, oh my God, that like, what the fuck? I go right back and look at pictures from 10 years ago. That was always there. I never, I never noticed it. And then I noticed something. I noticed one of my lats connects a little further in than the other. I'm like, fuck, did I tear that? Went back and looked at old pictures. Nope, it was always there. So as you get become older, you become more observant and you start noticing things. But the thing is, they were always there. So a lot of young kids, they just don't pay attention to, to things like, like, I, I know I didn't pay attention to gas and bloating. Oh, it'll be better later. Fuck it. Like, I just didn't think about it. I just didn't well, what is the difference between about. feeling bloated and just being full, right? Because those are two different things. Well, when you're bloated, you're generally gassy. You generally feel a lot of pressure. You generally don't feel very good. If you're eating to the point where you feel like you're bloated and gassy and don't feel good, you're eating too much. Because guys will say – processing everything. Guys will say, yeah, like in an off season, you know, that just comes to the territory. You're pushing food. You're going to feel like shit. You're going to feel lethargic. You're going to want to throw you're up. You're going like... to feel lethargic and you're going to feel bad to an extent, but you should never feel like your fucking stomach's so full you want to throw up. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, know, shouldn't, you shouldn't, be, shouldn't be forcing you shouldn't be, food. You shouldn't be bloated and, and, and gassy. Like, listen – you're not always going to be hungry. You're going to have to force down some meals, but you should not be to the point where you're fucking nauseous and your stomach hurts and you know you, you you're constipated or or you're you're shitting seven times a day. You're, that means you're not absorbing anything, you know. So there's a lot of signs to look for, and this is why people need coaches because I put a lot of this on my questionnaire. I put a lot of this on my check-in forms, and I ask people all the time, you know, are you regular? How are things? How many times when you were younger, you probably don't even realize when you were a teenager and you had diarrhea or something, you never stopped to think, why do I have diarrhea? You're yeah. just like, oh, I just want to get rid of it. I want it to stop. That's it. But you never analyzed what fucking caused it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and as kids, we generally don't do that. Whereas adults, we do, you know? So you never make these connections because you just never even thought about it. You're just like, I just wanted to get better. You know, I could think of a million times when I was a kid and I got diarrhea and I never even once thought about why. <laughs> yeah. Well, as somebody you know. who's trying to, you know, get into this, say they don't have a coach, how do they figure out how much food they exactly need to really grow and maximize muscle growth? Because we know, depending, obviously, it's all situational where the person's at, how much body fat they have. But in, in every situation, the scale doesn't always necessarily need to be going up. And that's what people are focused on, you know, is the way moving up on the scale, but they could be growing without that even moving. So how do they know? Here's my answer. What? Here's my answer. 
Did you play sports when you were a kid? Did I play football? I ran cross country. Did you have a football coach? Yes. Would you have played without a coach? No. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I mean, I know that's the fucking basic answer. I know that is. You need a coach. Would you have, would you have I know played? That is. There's no. There's no sport in the world where people play without coaches. No, I know, I know. And a lot of guys, you know, guys fucking think they can get around by bodybuilding, you know, year round and 12 weeks out, I'll get a coach for prep. It's retarded. You know, you shouldn't do that. about me is I'm never going to give the PC answer. I am never going to give an answer just to make people happy and satisfy people. People ask me for cycles and insulin protocols and things like that. My answer is always, it depends. Well, let's just say- My answer here, my, my answer is there's no way they're going to figure it out on their own. Okay. <laughs> they're not. They're not going to get it right on their own. They might get close and get some beginner results, but they're going to they're going to get there because of their beginner results. You're well, not going to get think? a little elite level of figuring it out. Well, not so about elite. I'm just talking about you know, let's say a lifestyle guy, a guy that's not really competing, doesn't have a coach, doesn't want to get a coach, but is trying to I figure out know. if they need to increase food more or not to put keep pushing growth. Like, are there indicators to look for if you're not eating enough? Yeah, trial and error. If you're you know yeah. if if your digestion is good, if you're lifting hard and you're not putting on muscle, then obviously you need more calories. The first thing I would increase is protein. Then I would add fats and then I would add carbohydrates last, unless you're more of an ectomorph. If you're a fast metabolism type then carbohydrates are probably the first thing you need to increase. But the fact of the matter is it's going to be trial and error at that point. If it's a lifestyle person or somebody who's in that situation is you're going to have to start with a basic idea. Um, like when I write plans now, I usually nail it on the first shot. Has there been times when within the first week I've had to make an edit? Yeah, there has, but I typically nail it on the first shot now because i'm experienced though do you think food always needs to be going up even like in a competitor like because i'll have guys where they are just consistently growing at a set amount and i don't need to touch it for you know weeks even sometimes like two three months and they're just consistently just oh. keep growing staying lean so food doesn't always need to be pushed up right well i actually uh put the put a diagram together that's on my page for this that shows the process of recompositioning and how by you get leaner, you you improve sensitivity, you improve sensitivity, it's partitioning increases, partitioning increases, more of the food that you're eating goes to the right places. So that's like your muscles getting a calorie increase, because now when they were maybe, um, these are bullshit numbers, but maybe they were absorbing 50, then maybe your muscles were getting 50, 50% 50 of the food you eat, and now they're getting 60, and now they're getting 70. Well, if the diet's the same, but they're getting a higher percentage, well, guess what? It's a calorie increase. So like you said, there's a lot of times you can leave people. I have people that I leave on the same diet for six months, nine months. Because yeah, and they just continuously just working, keep growing into that weight that they're at. Coaches fuck this up a lot. They fuck this up a lot because they're worried about client retention. They're worried about entertaining people rather than results. Yeah, because so guys get bored. They're like, I need a change. And you know what? Bodybuilding is Groundhog's Day. Um, I see coaches that change a contest prep diet every week. You know, you got 16 weeks of prep. They got 16 revisions. But you know what? If they drop three pounds last week, why am I going to cut your calories down? You're still getting yeah. leaner. It's, it's working. working. Stop fixing what's not broken. If, if my guys are putting on muscle, if they're getting stronger every week, it's working. Why am I going to change what's working? Because you know what happens? Eventually, you keep adding food. When the person was already growing to begin with, eventually they get fat. They get fat. You destroy their sensitivity. You destroy their response. And now they're not growing. So now yeah. what you have to do is diet them down restart again and now you just lost a month two months all because you just kept piling food on when you didn't have to if yeah. they're growing don't touch it if they're getting leaner don't touch it that's the yeah. answer yeah and a lot of that comes down to just being able to visually assess somebody too because like if we have somebody who's like skinny fat you know we might have them in a set amount and the scale might not be going up, but you could tell like they're they're getting somewhat leaner. They're gaining more muscle tissue over time growing into that. But we don't want to necessarily might not want to put them in a deficit just to get them leaner. We might just want to have them grow into that weight. And, that, and, that, and that's again, that's where a coach comes in. The average person is not going to be able to judge, you know, how well they're growing by looking at pictures. First yeah. of all, they usually don't take pictures and compare them like a coach would. So you don't even have anything to reference in the first place. You know, they're taking mirror selfies or they're flexing in the mirror at the gym. That's not standing in a place, hitting a pose, looking at proportions and seeing where your development is. So unless they're taking pictures and comparing them themselves, they're not even giving themselves a fair chance. So again, this is where a coach's eye comes in, but I don't typically go by that. I judge performance. If their performance is increasing, something has to account for that. 
obviously you're growing if you're continually getting stronger or you're continually getting more reps or if something is progressing there's a reason it's progressing you know strength doesn't come out of nowhere it's not magic you yeah. know you could think in terms of neural drive and neural efficiency but that only happens to to, to a certain extent and when you get into an advanced competitor that's not going to be a very changing variable yeah so what I do is I gauge performance and that's why that's in all my check-in forms is in all my questionnaires. And I watch that like a hawk. I need that person to always either be getting stronger or be getting better reps or have more control or more tempo or different volume structures, something that's showing me that their lifting is getting better. Um, yeah. One of the biggest problems that I see in, you know, these you young guys really listen to this point. When we go to football practice, we're trying to get better every day. They don't view going to the gym as a skill. They think, okay, Sebastian showed me this exercise. I got it right. This is as far as it goes. No, you can yeah. continue to get better at that exercise for years. Yeah. So they don't look at the gym as gaining a skill and learning. They don't look at the gym as practice. They don't look at the gym as improving their bodybuilding skills, where you need to always look at that. You need to always be self-assessing. How was that set? How were those reps? Did I control it? Did I hold form when I was squatting or when I was deadlifting? Did I shoot my hips on that? Um, did my elbows flare on a press? You know, looking for all of these things that you can improve. If you took a set where you press 225 for 10, and then you continually do that with a better tempo, better control, better form, then you did progress. Then you did progress. And yeah. that's what we're looking for. I'm constantly looking for performance progression because that's something you can quantify. And this is again. What Dante Trudel innovated is he made everybody really hooked on the logbook. The logbook came from him. Mm -hmm. You know, other people have done it in the past, but he made the logbook famous because now you can quantify something. You have a goal, a physical goal. You're not trying to judge fatigue or pump or, you know, things that are very hard to quantify. You have numbers there. So well, the thing about logbooking, the thing about logbooking is people get hooked on those numbers. And like you said, you know, well, progression is not always about the numbers. It might be about just improving that set. And at that point, you know, people got to write out a whole sentence, how the logbook wrote, but usually they're just focused on this weight, this amount of reps. And well, I have got to be careful with that because a lot, because, you know, and again, this is why you need a coach to monitor these things. You've got to be careful with the constant progressive overload thing, because a lot of times, um, and I've done this, everybody has done this. You want to progress a number so much or get an extra rep that you break your form a little bit. Even a and little bit because it's a huge problem. That, that, that's not progressive overload. That's you breaking focus and breaking discipline in order to get more reps. Just because the logbook says you got more reps doesn't mean that you progressed. You know, just because you can write down one more number because you, you can make this week 11 and the last week was 10, that doesn't mean you progressed unless the sets were identical. If you broke your form at all, it doesn't count. So, yes, like chasing the logbook sometimes. We'll have we'll will make people sometimes break form and 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 do things that they normally wouldn't do to continually progress the logbook and that's the wrong approach. If you don't make progress this week, maybe switch out the exercise. Maybe take maybe work into a different rest rep range. Maybe take a week off. Maybe assess that maybe you didn't take enough days off this week. Um, that's one thing that you'll find working with me and that everybody finds working with me is my answer is almost always back off, take a rest day intermittent fast your stomach's hurting intermittent fast skip a meal body built, branch warren said though the, the number one thing that dedicated competitors don't know how to do is back off yeah they don't know how you know i had one guy come to me recently he was like i'll train twice a day every day if you tell me to because i'm so dedicated i said okay you're that dedicated i want you training four days a week i can't do that well you just said you'd do anything mm -hmm. you want to go to the gym twice a day yeah that doesn't mean you're working hard you want to do that People yeah. say, oh, I, I bust my ass in the gym. The gym is fun. That's the easy part. Did yeah. you get all your meals in? Did you not yeah. miss a meal for six months? That's the hard part. Yeah. And that, and then, you know, then the conversation changes because it's not what you want to do. Willing to do anything means you're willing to do the things you don't want to do too. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I want to talk about, you know, go back to, you said something about insulin sensitivity and I know you are a big advocate of keeping food lower carbohydrates specifically lower on rest days and i'm assuming that's to help with insulin sensitivity right 100 percent is well it's 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 not just carbohydrates um that's what it appears at a first glance it's calories because yeah. 
carbohydrates low but calories still high would not improve your sensitivity Yeah, because some people think i've said that before and like when i say reduction of carbs i also mean just the total calories as well but people think like well then i have to replace that amount of calories with fats and protein it's like no the entire carbs are, the carbs are the carbs are what i pull out yeah but I, I pull the carbs out and that's where the calorie reduction is coming from yeah fats and protein are still where they need to be i'm making sure you're they still getting the enough essential fatty acids and essential amino acids to recover from the week's work and to build muscle. So you still have all the materials you need to build muscle. I'm just removing the energy source because you don't need it. Yeah. So, so how do we technically it's, a cal technically it's a calorie reduction, but I pull the carbs. Yeah. Cause that's where it would make the most sense. Cause you don't need carbohydrates. You don't, there's no, you don't, it's, need, them. You don't so need the fuel source. Yeah. But, um, so we do that to help it improve insulin sensitivity. I, th I think a lot of people just don't know about insulin sensitivity in general um, and how, much of a factor that plays into, you know, optimizing progression. So do you want to touch on that? What are some signs to look for to know if you are becoming insulin, insulin, sensitive. insulin sensitivity, insulin sensitivity and nutrient partitioning is a top five factor overall in fitness period. If, if, if you were asking me what the, what are, what are the five things that I would focus on? If I only had five things I could focus on for a pro bodybuilder, insulin sensitivity be at the top of the list simply because insulin sensitivity determines um, how much and how well the nutrients get into your cells and, and do the job they need. And, and people don't realize insulin sensitivity that, that, um, relates to amino acids too. It's not just carbohydrates, you know, so you're getting your building blocks inside the cell, you're getting your energy sources inside the cell and you're getting everything that you need into the cell that's going to repair. And that's what really matters. And people don't really, um, take that into account as much as they should. If you look at all of the top pros, they all have great insulin sensitivity. I will like, and and now um, a lot of people were doing fasted blood glucose in the morning, but now that's obsolete. And I've been saying this a lot. It hasn't caught on yet because I don't have like, a, I have like 30 something thousand followers. I don't have a gigantic platform. And typically you go by A1C. the people that follow me, exactly. But the people that follow me are typically the advanced people in the industry. Every Olympian knows me, every top, uh, uh, amateur knows me but the general people don't know me only people that are very serious know me so it hasn't gone that far but yes a1c tests have now become over the counter in the united states you can get them off amazon and your a1c test is an average of where your blood glucose was over three months and that's going to tell you how insulin sensitive you are right now at this point in time and if you're over i don't let my guys get over a 5.2 if you get to 5.3 you're in you're in trouble now um 5.4, 5.5, you're moving towards pre-diabetic. You want your you want your A1C to be around a 5.0, 5.1 off season. Um, now, again, if I've checked pros and they all typically end up being 4.9, 4.8. The lower it is, the better, right? Diets, the lower it is, the better. Yeah. And 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 that and that just shows why they respond so well. If you see like a very genetic elite bodybuilder eat something, you'll watch them inflate. You know they won't bloat. Everything goes where it's supposed to go. So what leads? And that's to, because of their sensitivity. What leads to poor sensitivity? And is there any way, like any signs you could have to tell that besides just getting an A one C test, like knowing like maybe like I'm not as high body fat. High body fat is it? That's really it. Body getting, composition. Getting body fat. composition control is number one. Yeah, that's why I don't get too fat in the off season. Stay lean. Yeah. And, 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 and further to the point, if you ever see natural bodybuilders that are really good, they stay lean year round, very lean. Yeah. Why? Because they don't have the steroids to help them. So their insulin sensitivity without that, they can't bodybuild. They will yeah. never improve. So you see, but you see like, like PED enhanced bodybuilders, they get bloaty, they get fat and whatnot. You know, they give themselves wiggle room, but a, a natural bodybuilder, you'll never find a good one who gets fat in the off season because no. that, that, that would kill their response and they wouldn't grow. Not so good ones. No. Staying, staying reasonable composite. Now, listen, some people will grow better with, you have to really push their weight up. Body fat will get a little high. There's variance Other within it. Some I guys, find, yeah. Some guys need to get a Other little guys more Other guys I find you have to keep very lean. That's why a lot of people ask me questions all the time. And my answer is always, it depends because everything mm -hmm. is variable. That's like the but answer that we've got on every episode. It, dep it always depends. It always depends. But generally yeah. you need to stay reasonably lean to make sure that your food is being partitioned. Partition just means, because I've been saying this a number of times now on this, on this podcast, partition means where everything is divided up. Partition would be like rationing, like how much of this goes there, how much of this goes there, how much of this goes there. Good partitioning means more of your food is going to muscle and not to being burned off or to body fat. That's what that means. And yeah, that's so why we insulin... want good partitioning. 
And good partitioning is governed by how insulin sensitive you are. Yeah. That's why people say insulin is the most anabolic hormone. Yes. And a lot of people, one really well-known coach that you probably know of, um, even said on a podcast years ago that he thinks that insulin doesn't do anything. And that was probably one of the dumbest fucking things he's ever said. So I don't think it really builds muscle. I don't think it works out of his fucking mind. You know, like if you don't understand insulin, you shouldn't be coaching to begin with. You know? Yeah. Well, now if you're and more, I'm talking about the basics. If you're more insulin resistant, because we know this is, comes back to the thing about having like a structured diet, not following if it fits your macros, because certain carbohydrate sources are more easily converted into fat, like fats more converted to fat, fructose is more easily converted into fat. So if you become like more insulin resistant, basically like having all like sugar, the like fucking fruit or juices and stuff is going to be much more easily contributed to fat, right? Rather than actually being utilized. Um, well, it, 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 well, it really depends because you have to think of not just glycemic index, but glycemic load. If yeah. your blood sugar is tending, if your blood sugar sits high for a longer period of time, well, guess what? You're not going to need all that energy at that, at that immediate time. So because you don't need all of that energy at that immediate time, your body's going to store some of it. So if you took, say, 50 grams of carbs and slowly dispersed it over a two hour period, well, guess what? Your body is going to get little by little by little by little by little by little and use it as it goes, right? If that were to all hit your bloodstream at once, your body would say, okay, we're going to use what we need here, but now we have all this extra. What do we do? Oh, we store it. So yeah, but you have a higher glycemic load, which is a more total glucose in your bloodstream for a long period of time in an acute, in a short period, then yeah, you're going to, you're going to have a tendency to store more. And this is going to go against all the law of thermodynamics people and this and that, but the people with the law of thermodynamics and all that, all those, that terminology, which I'm not disagreeing with because calories in calories out does matter, but your response also matters. If I took one per, if I took, if I took you and I took you at a point where you're really lean or a point where you're really fat and I gave you an, the identical fucking program and diet, you would have two different responses. Yeah, absolutely. So how are you going to tell me that only that that the only thing that matters is calories in, calories out? Because it matters what your body does with those calories. Yeah, too. no, it doesn't matter. Okay, so that that <laughs> leads me to another question now is because, you know, I, I talked about this with you already on the phone, you know, because um, guys will say that calories in, calories out is the only thing that matters. And we're talking about, you know, from a general standpoint of just gaining weight or losing weight, sure, it might. But, you know, when we're talking about actually optimizing muscle growth or getting lean enough for a show as a competitor, especially if you're natural – Calories in, calories out is not the only thing that matters when you're competing as a natural. Once you get to that certain point of being that lean, you know, metabolic thyroid function, all that stuff comes into play. So I don't know if you want to touch on that a bit because it's not just the only get, thing. When you get leaner, your thyroid, your your thyroid is going to slow down. You know, there's a lot of cases where um, coaches have destroyed women's thyroids. Women's thyroids are a lot more delicate than men. When they get leaner, their their thyroids, have, their met metabolic rates have a tendency to slow more than men. And if you keep them like that for a long period of time, we have what's called metabolic damage, which is basically a meta metabolic slowdown. Yeah, and hypothyroidism. You could have a, yeah, and you could have a an individual who is responding very well to a certain diet, but that if you put them on, like I said, if you put them on that same diet at another peer point in time, when their metabolic rate is different, when their when their response is different, then they're going to have a different outcome. Like I just said, it's a prime example. If I took you at 8% body fat and I took you at 15% body fat and put you on the same fucking program for two months, you were going to look drastically different at the end. Yeah. Let me say this. So, you know, like I said, they say this is the only thing that matters, but, you know, with an enhanced competitor, let's say, you know, they're in prep, they're around like maybe they're deep in it, they're lean, they're like 1,800 calories or something, you know, thyroid function is going down. Typically what an enhanced competitor is going to do is, you know, implement T3 at some point, but a natural competitor won't do that. So how do we keep thyroid function up? Because people, the way people say this is just they need to be in a bigger deficit to the point where they're eating 1,000 calories doing – yeah. Well, here's the thing. We, we want to affect the response. You've taken my class, so you yeah. know the answer to this. But I I'm, I'm asking, asking this yeah, you. yeah, I know the answer. You want, but... you, want me to, you want this for the listeners, I understand. Yeah. So um, the way we do this is refeeds. Now, um, typically in the past, people will do one cheat meal or one day of refeeds. And then a lot of research has shown that the, the metabolic rate is not affected by one day. You need at least two. So all of my refeeds with my clients are either two or three days consecutive because you need a number of days to affect the metabolic rate. And what you'll actually see is um, at the end of some diets, I end up refeeding people on thousand grams of carbs, 1200 grams of carbs, and then they hit a new low in the next four days. Yep. You know, after I've just, I, I put them on a thousand grams of carbs for two days and four days later, they're at a new low again. 
And then I refeed them on the same thing again. And then four or five days later, they're at a new low again because I have their metabolism going. Whereas if I had not implemented those refeeds and just kept the diet as it was, they would not have hit a new low. Okay. So what you're doing is you're basically, um, you know, kind of like giving it a push. And then it, at that point, when you're getting lean into prep, when you're getting like- Your body thinks fatigue, you're dying. It doesn't want to lose more fucking fat. So your body, yes. So your body is trying to resist any body fat loss. So it's kind of like into like pushing a car that's not on. You know, it's going to get some momentum, but eventually it's going to slow down and stop. And then you just got to give it another push. Yeah. So it's, this is essentially giving the metabolism a little bit of a push, but this also does other things because we've just filled out. We're going to have better workouts. We're going to be able yeah. to do more glycogen longer you're going to be able to create more um create more of a deficit and this is again i keep referencing my, one of my mentors john meadows and he even said he's like i will never never cut pre-workout carbs on somebody because if you look at it this way if you're drained and you walk into the workout and you're going to do x amount of work right and you're going to be tired and you're going to be depleted you're not going to be able to do high reps you're not going to be able to get your best lifts in no matter how much you push so you're going to have burned a certain amount of calories and that's it. Now, if I fuel you before the workout and you hit great lifts and you get a lot of volume, then you get a lot of work done. Well, guess what? Now your body has to repair all that extra damage that was done over the next couple of days. So your metabolism is going to be higher. Not only that, you'll have burned up more calories because you'll have gotten your heart rate higher, done more work. You'll have created more of a deficit, EPOC and things like that, excess mm -hmm. post-oxygen consumption, calorie debt, and things like that, that your body is going to need to make up for. So I gave my body extra calories at the beginning of the workout, but that pushed my performance through the roof. So now I have a debt to repay that normally wouldn't have been that high. So over the next 48 hours, I'm going to be burning more calories, trying to repair all of the damage that I've done. So consequently, over a period of time, I'll have actually burned more calories than we're actually in the 50 grams of carbs I had pre-workout. Yeah. I'll yeah. burn that and then some. So it's going to amplify my effects. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, a lot of guys, just a lot of these, these coaches – just don't understand these aspects and these mechanisms. They only understand the surface level shit like calories. Oh, you're not losing weight. We're doing a prep. We just need less calories, more cardio. And what ends up happening is since their body's in that survival mechanism, they might end up losing weight. But at that cost, you know, they're going to waste muscle tissue. They're probably going to hold on to that fat, maybe even hold on to water. You know, it's going to just result in a more detrimental result at the end of the day. We, we, we have today and we typically do on all podcasts bashed, you know, quote unquote, coach, most coaches. And the fact of the matter is, is, it's not that there's, it's not that people are meaning to be bad coaches. It's that coaching is a new thing. It's young. It's, it's, it's 15 years old having coaches in bodybuilding. Previous to this, people just didn't get in great shape or the only people that competed are the genetic elite who kind of got that way by accident. Now we can take people who are not the genetic elite and turn them pro because we have a lot more knowledge of how things work. So we can make more things work now and we can make things better. But the fact of the matter is, this hasn't been around long enough for like benchmarks to be set. There's if you go on 10 different pages, you're going to get 10 different answers and nobody is really sure who's right or wrong. And there's nobody to police it. And you have people bashing each other and, and, and stitching TikToks and yeah. making fun of each other and saying this guy's wrong. And then somebody else makes a video that says you're wrong. And then somebody else makes a video that says he's wrong. And, and there's so much conflicting information. And that's kind of yeah, we talked about this. That's good. That's my mission to kind of leave this field when I'm done as like a benchmark. So people understand certain things. Like I say certain things all the time. I've made posts like this. Like if your coach puts you on a hundred micrograms of T3, <laughs> a shitty coach. Yeah. You know, cause T3 is essentially synthetic thyroid. It makes up, like you said, for the slow metabolism, but yeah. if you know how to use food, you really don't have to use much T3. So if you have a coach that puts you on a hundred mics of T3, it just means that they didn't know how to use nutrition. You know, and a lot of people, a lot of coaches follow these insulin protocols. There's people that try to use insulin without actual knowledge of insulin. I, I'm a strong believer that you should know how things are um, applied in the medical field and then you apply it to the fitness field. They think that insulin was invented. It wasn't invented so you can get big. It wasn't invented so you can get pumps and fill out for shows. Yeah. So learn its actual mechanisms and how it actually works and then decide how you're going to apply it. But the problem is most people don't. So education is just now becoming popular. And that's yeah. why you see a lot of pay sites and educational YouTubes and things like that. We didn't have that when I was a kid, none of that. So I think if we give it more time and enough people set good examples, like I said, I know I, I said to you in a conversation we had on the phone that one day when, you know, you're a top Olympian, 
I think it would be great if you also became an educational resource to show like, look, I'm not a dumb meathead. This is how we do things. And you'll have the power to influence people and educate people the proper way. You know, we don't have that right now. Like I said, I love Chris Bumstead, but how much does he teach people? Nothing, nothing. Chris doesn't want to get involved with the drama. <laughs> well, I understand well, the thing, that. Nobody he, wants to deal he, with these fucking kids, man. I mean, you go on, you see, I think nobody wants to deal with them. It's fucking No, bad. I get, I get yeah. it, but I get it. But think of the, think of the difference he could make if he did. I know. I know. Yeah. I, I he you definitely know? could. So a lot, a lot of them we could. Just need, we just need more people with the correct information. You know, I joke around all the time and I'll say like, nobody will jump on a podcast and debate me ever. Well, I'm not going to say nobody, you know, who could jump, who, who could jump on the, on a podcast and debate me, Chris Tuttle, Dorian Hamilton, Nelson Jones. But you know what? It would just be us agreeing with each other the whole fucking time. Yeah. So the people that could debate me won't debate me because we'll just be, a, we'll just be agreeing because there's a very small, um, I guess, sector or, or group of coaches who really do know what they're doing, but they're not the famous coaches. Well, what I wish would happen, what I wish would really happen. And I know this will never happen, but it would really set the standard and it would really like change the industry is if we had you like all the top coaches, all the guys, all the, you know, the YouTubers, the fucking, all the guys that have, you know, reputation, whether it's, you know, big to the general population or just niche in bodybuilding sat at a round table and just went like did podcasts, like talked over every topic and people would start to see like through the bullshit, do these guys really agree with each other? Maybe they explain things a little bit differently, the nuance between it, but it would clear a lot of shit up because we'd have everybody involved in the conversation we actually we actually plan to do that at some point you know but right now you have so many people saying different things um and listen the listeners don't know how to pick out who's right and wrong you know um if 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 you looked at phil heath you would assume he knows how to build arms you know like you would think that but he, he he's very limited because he never had to figure anything out it just worked for him from day one you know, so you don't really know who to listen to. And I always give this analogy. Could you pick out who the best astrophysicist was if I lined 10 of them up for you? No, because you don't know astrophysics. So yeah. the people that are listening to all these coaches are not educated to determine who's right and who's wrong and who knows what they're talking about, who doesn't. The only people that actually know are the coaches. But you know what? No one's going to rush to say, uh, you know, Chris or Phil or Dorian knows more than me. They're not going to blow their own spot up like that if they're successful you know if they're latching on to genetic anomalies and those people are winning shows and making them look good they're not going to sit there and admit that somebody else is smarter than them yeah. you know so it, it, the only way to do it is to really you know raise the bar and, and raise awareness and do it more often you know that way you know you can't police this you can't just pick on everybody who does something wrong every time i get a bad program i can't post it on my story and say look at this asshole it doesn't work that way and people are just going to think i'm the asshole the way yeah. you do it is drawing attention to the correct information for long periods of time and you like you said seeing experts agree so I think that is the way to do it. But the problem you know, is that people platforms. are so fucking dogmatic and they get these camps like everybody's because we have all this research and everybody's so stuck on the literature. Everybody, they get into those camps. Of, if you don't have literature to cite me, don't talk about it. And I could sit here and explain to you exactly how your thyroid works. But if I don't provide a site, a source to explain how the thyroid works, you know, then they discredit everything you said. It just comes down to you being a, you know individual that's able to critically think understand what i'm saying and then maybe you go look up how does fucking thyroid function work start reading about it and you'll realize everything i'm saying is just the mechanism behind it and there may not be an exact study to show you what i'm saying it's not that simple we had we we had this conversation a lot of times like for somebody like you that's young how are you going to argue with somebody who throws research at you and says well look here's my proof whereas you know i have a little bit more experience and, and things like that like if somebody tries to throw research at me and they're wrong, I'm going to go, I'm not going to just read the fucking abstract and conclusion. I'm going to read the entire, I'm going to read through the entire paper and I'm going to punch holes in it. I'm going to say, well, what about this? 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 And I'm going to tear the paper apart and be like, well, you just tried to cite something that's bullshit. Yeah. You know, so yeah, that's what they do all the time. People, they don't, they don't know how to actually look at the research and say, you know, if somebody says, oh, well, this works and here's the research that proves it, everybody just accepts it. You know, yeah. they don't think to read through it and and, and think for themselves because they don't know how they're not educated enough in the how, and they, they're just taking people's word for it. And, and I understand that's always how things are always going to be. But if we if we change the field a little bit and, and, and make education more popular and uniform across the board, then, you know, people are going to start learning more of the right information and then good things are going to happen. Because, I you know, I, I, I don't pull punches. I, I I say the truth and people don't like some of the things that I say, like I've said most a lot of the top coaches at the olympia are not the best coaches in the world they're the guys who got in early got genetic anomalies got hard workers the people worked hard won 
built their reputations and they keep getting people who don't know any better. Like, you know, you've got somebody from another country who's coming in genetic anomaly. Well, which coach has the most wins? Oh, this guy does. Okay. I'm going to go with him, but they're not the best coaches. If I stuck them on a podcast, you know, they, they, they get ripped apart against certain other people. If you were talking about general knowledge and the way things actually work, you know, you, you, you don't, people never stop to think that, Oh, a pro looked great on stage, but could he have looked better? You know, yeah. could he have held a little bit more muscle? Could he have kept the muscle from shrinking? Could he have had more detail? Could he have been a little drier? Could he have been a little healthier? You know, um, people don't take these things into consideration. They see a, they see an end product and that's it. Oh, that guy was shredded. Yeah, but how much muscle did he lose? You know, um, oh, he was dry, but he took six diazides. You're like, you know, like yeah. they, they don't take these things into consideration because they don't know to. And I think that slowly but surely you see some of the, better coaches working their way into the Olympia lineups and people are slowly starting to figure things out. And I think 10 years from now, all the most popular coaches right now will not be the top coaches. I think as time passes, cream rises to the top, education becomes more popular and people see how things work and see people see how the capabilities of the actual good coaches when they get a genetic anomaly and what they actually can do with somebody, then those coaches are going to either be faced with the fact that they need to get more educated and become better at what they do, or they're going to be phased out, you know? Yeah. So you eliminate the, eliminate people by raising the bar. And, yeah. and I think that's, what's going to end up happening. Mark my words, 10 years from now, you're not going to see the same coaches co- coaching the Olympians. You're not, you're yeah. going to see all of the up and comers right now that are really putting their time in with education and doing their diligence and paying attention and taking classes and learning and studying and improving their skills and gaining more experience with a wide variety of people. There's a lot of people that I know that have worked with these top Olympian coaches and didn't get great results at all. And I'm telling you people that really educate, really execute. And that's because the, a lot of these top coaches only know how to coach in a perfect scenario. They don't know how to deal with, you know, problems and issues. You, you, <laughs> you know what know. I'm thinking, but I'm not going to say it. I know. I know. I want to, okay. I want to touch on, I want you to just clarify something. I want you to reconfirm because I've said this a million times and people always argue with me. So I want you to just, you know, confirm that I'm right here. Fasted cardio versus cardio any other time of the day fasted cardio is going to aid in more fat loss um yes and no it's situational um like uh i always bring up the fact that um i i make no because it comes back to the same thing anymore. comes back to the same thing where people think only the calorie expenditure matters when it doesn't well it, other factors matter like yeah. um I'm going to bring up James Hollingshead, who I worked with. Um, he's an Olympian bodybuilder. Um, I didn't get him to the Olympia. We, we parted ways. We had a falling out before that. So uh, we both mutually decided to stop working together. Um, but he hadn't ever placed in a pro show until I got him. And then when I had him, when he worked with me, he never missed first call out ever. So, you know, we made some serious jumps. And one of the things that we had seen was his legs like to shrink in prep. So because of that, and because he worked, because he he didn't have a job, he was always home and he had the ability to do this. I had him eating a meal, waiting for that blood glucose to come back down and that whole meal to clear and then do his morning cardio because I didn't want his legs to incur the work, excuse me, fasted and, and risk them shrinking. So in a situation like that, you know, there's more than one factor to consider than just burning body fat, because if his legs shrink, then he has less muscle. If he has less muscle, his metabolism is going slower. Yeah. His metabolism gets slower. I can't feed him as much. If I can't feed him as much, now he's not getting as many nutrients. He can start shrinking all over. So in order to preserve that muscle, I picked a different strategy. Now, if we're talking about fasted cardio versus cal- cardio later in the day, again, this is the calories in, calories out crowd. And I've got to bring something up before to com- to, to, to kind of uh, – lay the groundwork to discuss this. Um, again, James Holling said, when I worked with him, um, anybody who was following me in 2019 saw that we were mid off season. All of a sudden he was in prep ready to do a show and like, what the fuck? Well, the thing was um, I conducted an experiment with blood glucose and I showed that when we left his diet alone, the same diet, because I had him microdosing insulin and people don't do this because you're not experienced enough to do this unless somebody is guiding you, you can kill yourself. I had him microdosing insulin before each meal to put himself into range to make sure his blood glucose was below 90 or below 85. And what that did was because his blood glucose was lower, his body was more accepting of food, more sensitive because it was more accepting of food and the food went to the right places. So without changing his diet or touching the calories or touching the cardio or touching the training or cutting or, or, or touching the drugs or using any fat burners, didn't change anything. 
All they did was make sure he microdosed his insulin before each meal to bring his glucose into range. And I'm talking two IUs, three IUs at most. He, his glutes started coming in. We, they, he was so lean. He's like, fuck, there's a show in six weeks. We might as well just do it. And we did. And he took third, the pro show. You know, just because I showed that the same calories, and this is for the calories in, calories out crowd. I didn't cut calories. And because I changed his response, he got leaner and he got bigger. Yeah. So for the calories in, calories out crowd, you can cite science all you want. Yes. Like I said, I'm not saying calories in, calories out doesn't matter. I'm saying it's not the only factor. Your response matters too when we're considering that. So in the morning, blood glucose is low. You have been starved for an energy source. There's no energy sources available except stored energy. So you are going to tap into that sooner. If you are not fasted, there's going to be some there's going to be some triglycerides in your bloodstream. There's going to be some glucose in your bloodstream. There's going to be some amino acids in your bloodstream. You start doing cardio, you're going to burn that up, the immediate fuel source, before you tap into fat. Now, if there's no energy source in your bloodstream, your body has no choice but to tap into fat immediately. Mix of fat and oxygen, yes, a little bit of uh, glycogen, a little bit of glucose. I'm sure there's something there. But um, well, that's why seen, we do the the abs and calves before fast cardio to burn up any, any excess glycogen. That. Yeah. Because that brings down blood glucose. Yeah. And then you're going to be, you know, there's a saying that, or not a saying, but like they always say, yeah, you don't burn, burn any body fat during cardio for the first 15 minutes. People, you, we, everybody's heard that. You'll, you'll read that in NASM. You'll read that in, S in SCA. You'll read that in ACE. You'll read that in all the certifications. You'll read that in all the literature. It takes time to, to for your body to switch over to a fat burning mode, right? And start burning body fat. That's because your body's trying to burn up everything in the bloodstream first. That's readily available. It's immediately available. You're going to burn that up before your body taps into energy stores. If I have food on the table, are you going to run to the store to go get food? Or are you going to go digging in the cabinets? No, there's food right in front of you. Yeah. So if you have glucose and triglycerides and amino acids in your bloodstream that's readily available that's the first thing you're going to start burning and then once that's gone then you're going to tap into the stores so there's a reason again this is just logic logic who has the most experience with people losing body fat coaches right yeah one person might have helped themselves and seen what happened with themselves you might have conducted a research experiment with 10 people, 20 people, 30 people. But guess what? I've coached hundreds, if not thousands of people. So have a lot of other coaches that are similar to me. We all do fasted cardio with our guys. You think that we didn't see the fucking research and try it and think about it? You think we didn't fucking try it? Of course we did. Of course we thought about it. Of course we read the research. We concluded that it doesn't work as well by what we see. So if research says that it's just as good at other times, maybe that research is missing something because what I see is not that. And I'm pretty damn good at getting people to lose weight and get in shape. And so are a hell of a lot of other coaches and they all do fasting cardio. Well, I mean, it's just basic. It's not even like research because it's just basic science. It's like understanding how the body works. Insulin's lower, blood glucose is lower. You're going to have tap into fast stores more easily. Free fatty acid mobilization will be higher, like polysis, all that. So it just makes sense when you understand it. Here's, here's another thing that people don't understand about an educated coach and something like, like me, for example, a yeah. lot of times I get asked questions that I've never answered that question before. I've never looked it up before. I've never read that question before, but because of my base knowledge, my working knowledge of anatomy, physiology, um, you know, uh, chemistry, whatever it is that we're talking about, I can usually use that information to ascertain the answer to, to come to that conclusion and get the right answer because of my base knowledge. So yes, in this situation, we can take our base knowledge and, and what we know of how the body works and calories in calories out and body's responses and physiology and all of those factors and work it out like I just did for you. You know, there's obviously there's other factors, but I'm keeping this as simple as I can for your young viewers. But that's basically what it is, is we work it out like that. And like I said, look no further than the results. Who gets more results than anybody else on earth? Coaches, fitness coaches. And all of us have people doing fasted cardio, almost all of us. And, and our people are always in shape and they're always peeled and they always get good results. And Yes, we have tried the non-fast cardio. Yes, we've tried it at other times. It does not work the same. 
And I've even gone as far as people that I've had to add a nighttime cardio session that wasn't post-workout. I'll make sure that cardio session is done so three, three sessions. hours after a meal. Three sessions well, a day. Yeah, in, in rare situations, yes. But I'll still make sure that session is three hours after a meal. So that meal is gone because if anything yeah. from that meal is still lingering, that's what you're going to burn first. Yeah. You always want to be as close to fasted as you can be. So that's why post-workout is post post-workout second best time. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And and why, why is post-workout cardio so effective? Because you just burned up everything lifting. Yeah. But it's still, you're still more fasted after first thing in the morning than post-workout. So. But post-workout's fasted too. Yeah. Yeah. Because you've just burned up all your immediate energy sources. Yeah. Yeah. And people think, you know, they don't look at like the long run aspect of it too. Cause they think just calories in calories out, but they don't realize like if you're taking, even if it's like a little difference, if we did like a fucking study or something, the little difference, the fat, you know, might, you might burn from fasted, the pennies add up to dollars over time. You're going to get a much different result after 16 weeks of doing that. Absolutely. And, and this is my problem with all of these cocky, arrogant coaches that are coming online now and, and influencers and people that are talking about these things because they constantly say calories in, calories out. And I've said it repeatedly now. Yes, that matters. But you've got people thinking that that matters so much that they're not considering everything else. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not just calories in, calories out. It's your body's response to. Yeah. How well everything is working. Okay. Back to what? Okay, this kind of this kind of plays into, I guess, maybe maybe it plays into insulin sensitivity. Um, talk about how like you should, you know, you should have a pump within the workout. Why does taking a pump product, a pre workout, help in any aspect? You know, the not not the stimulant aspect, you know, caffeine and whatnot. Because I guess also to add to that, I mean, you if have you, you have to consider the stimulant aspect though. You have well, to. there's it's there's neural activation. There's nor there's there's, there's non stim pre workouts. But my point is. With a with a stimulant, they're they're literally characterized as central nervous system stimulants. Yeah, but caffeine so, is also a vasoconstrictor too. So without the pump aspect, like there's people who drink coffee be, just pre workout. Is that bad? Well, here's the here's the thing: too much of anything is bad. If you if you if you have 400 milligrams of caffeine, yes, you're going to have some vasoconstriction. But if you have a normal dose enough to get you going, it's not going to override the vasodilatory effects of training. Okay. So, you know, like, your a body coffee, is going to do. If somebody just drinks coffee pre workout. That's not a bad thing because it's not a lot of caffeine. Dude, eat enough, have enough sodium, eat enough carbohydrates, take a fucking bunch of stimulants and tell me you can't get a pump. Yeah. Yeah, it's not gonna, it's not gonna, it's not gonna slow it down as much as people think. Now, I'm not a big fan of stimulants all the time because people become reliant and dependent on it. And yes, it can minimize the pump if they're too high. But you've also got to understand that stimulants will also stimulate the central nervous system, so they're gonna increase your performance. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna allow you to fire off the muscles harder, especially if if you're if you're tired or you're in a in a different state. So one of the biggest problems people have is eating their meal too close to the workout. Mm -hmm. You have, uh, I'm gonna try to go through this briefly and simplify it as much as possible. I could do a whole lesson on this hours, but you have your parasympathetic nervous system and your sympathetic nervous system. So your parasympathetic is rest and so I'll just refer to them as rest and digest and fight or flight. Okay. Yeah. When one goes up, the other goes down. They should. So if you've eaten too close to your workout, your rest and digest is high. When your rest and digest is high, fight or flight, which is your performance, is low. If you're still got food in your stomach digesting, you're not going to perform. Yeah. Okay. So you have to understand that. And that's why I make sure my people make sure their pre-workout meal is at least 1.5 hours away from the workout. Because I don't want you still breaking down and digesting everything while the workout starts. Because it's yeah, going to think your performance. Yeah, people think they eat like... 45 30 minutes for a workout and then they're good to go no absolutely not so um i want you in the perfect state for performance and a lot of times when you have a a, a, a pre-workout product that has stimulants in it you've also got pump you've also got pump products in it right so they're kind of not only counteracting the effects of the stimulant and they're but they're facilitating pump a little bit to an extent are they going to make a huge difference no you're, nothing is going to get you as good of a pump as carbohydrates and sodium and, and water. Yeah. Nothing. But 
they help inches add, like you said, inches add up to miles. It matters, you know, so all of these tiny little things matter. You know, again, we're talking calories in calories out, but if I took the same fucking diet and I trained it, you know, 30 minutes post meal, instead of an hour and a half post meal, I'm not going to have as good of a workout. If I don't have as good of a workout, I'm not going to have as great output. If I don't have as great output, I'm not going to generate as much metabolism. I'm not going to generate as much stimulus and growth response. So ultimately, I'm not going to have the same results with the same fucking diet by changing where I trained. Yeah. Again, calories in, calories out is not the only thing. There's so many other factors. And you've got people pushing, talking about calories in, calories out so much that they're making everybody miss all of these other factors because they think that that's the only thing that matters. And it couldn't be the furthest thing from the truth. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 not at all. Um, okay. So back to, back to that though. Um, so with pump products, do you think, cause you could, like you said, you know, you get a pump fine with just proper hydration, sodium, um, carbohydrates. Do you see a pump products as a, a useful supplement then if it's, you could get the same result without it really, or can, or Absolutely. can you not? inches add up to miles you're yeah. getting you're getting more nervous system activation from the stimulants right yeah but just the and pump product with the stimulant well here's the thing i don't like non-pump pre, not non non-stim pre-workouts i just don't now well, they, i'll, I'll do take them work? with a stim i'll stack them together well for more of a pump right yeah, yeah. absolutely great idea but my point is uh you could use pump products yes they're going to do something and like i said inches add up to miles Remember, what is a pump product? It's something that causes vasodilation, which increases blood flow. Yep. Blood delivers all your nutrients, all of your energy, everything for recovery, everything for performance. So better blood delivery is going to be better to better performance. Okay. Common is, sense, right? I'm now. asking this because this is all leading into what I'm what I'm trying to get into because people, you know, make the argument that the pump doesn't matter or whatnot. So with that being said, more, you know, better blood flow, more nutrient delivery. Uh, the the I would say I would say the extent of the pump doesn't matter, but blood flow matters. Yes, yes, yes. But this leads me into the next thing because a lot of people say that uh, amino acids don't matter, not branch chain amino acids, essential amino acids, because we know branch chain amino acids are already in EEA, so there's no point in that. But, you know, I definitely see a place for amino acids intra workout. Um, but a lot of people argue you don't even need them because if you're eating enough protein throughout the day, you have amino acids in your body and also working out also stimulates muscle protein synthesis. So I want to hear your opinion on that. Why are EAAs there's, beneficial within a workout? Now, there's there's numerous ways to, to look at this. Um, and again, it depends on where you're placing everything. Um, if you're eating a proper diet, you'll always have amino acids in your bloodstream, right? Sufficient amino acids. Now, it's going to depend on when you're training. It's going to depend on the duration which you're training. Now, for, for my clients, for example, EAAs absolutely matter. And there's a reason for it. It's because, like I just said, I want to make sure my clients are eating at least one and a half, sometimes two hours pre-workout, right? That's how, yeah, that's how I always Everything. see it though. Okay, so now you, so now two hours has passed. Yep. Now we're going to start up a workout. Yep. Um, odds are in the first 15 minutes, there's going to be no amino acids in my bloodstream anymore. None. Yep. Um, so, you know, you're going to be, I'm not going to say necessarily in an extreme catabolic state, but you're not going to be in an anabolic state. Mm -hmm. So now two hours have passed. Now we've got 15, 20 minutes of warming up and potentiating. The way I design the workout plans for my clients, it probably takes about 90 minutes. Um, and then what I tell my clients is I tell them, don't rush to that post-workout meal. Because again, that's the nervous system shit. Parasympathetic. Your fight, or flight, your fight or flight is so high that your rest and digest is low. Because if you're still, your performance was up and you just stressed the living shit out of your body. That's why a lot of times after legs and hard leg workout, you can't eat. Yeah, because why? you're still in because, that fucking, yeah. Because you're still in fight or flight. And if you try to eat, you get nauseous. Yeah, it takes like it takes like an hour, an hour and a half. Your body sometimes. is not ready to accept food, yeah. so I tell them that. And and another reason why I tell them they don't have to rush to that post workout is because of the intra. So what did I do? Instead of going four or five hours without food and without amino acids, I put them in the intra drink. Yeah, that way you have sufficient essential amino acids. Non essential can be synthesized by the body, as we know, but essential we have to get from food. So I don't want a five hour block out of my day every day. And remember, we're going to sleep eight hours. We're not eating yeah. in the middle of the night, but we've already got four or five hours out of our 24 hours with no amino acids, Yeah, not building muscle. Yeah. But now we're going to take, you want another four or five hour block? Now you got 10 hours out of your day. Yeah. So now only half of your fucking day, you're building muscle. Yeah, exactly. Now, muscle is not, building muscle is not an acute process long-term, you know? 
it's great to have everything's formulated around the workout, but you need to be eating throughout the day consistently. And that's how we build muscle. You know, you're not going to eat, you know, breakfast and dinner and build a whole bunch of muscle. I don't care how big the meals are. Because you so, always want protein synthesis to be higher than degradation. Yes. Well, you always, exactly. So that's, that, that's how we determine muscle growth. Yeah. Protein synthesis has to outpace protein breakdown. Yeah. And so if we're not constantly staying above that line, then we're not going to build muscle. So if we have four or five hours in our sleep and then four or five hours from the beginning to the end of our workout, then now we've just got 10 hours, half of our day, not building muscle. Whereas I could put some EAAs into my intra drink, which are not going to affect digestion that much. They're going to absorb very, very well. So now thing, I yeah. just eliminated, I just eliminated that block. Yeah. So I, I already know this. I just wanted you to explain it to reconfirm it because, you know, I'm the way- to, listen, I don't think, I think the people that take EAAs between meals is stupid. Yeah. It's that's, when that's you have nice. a time, it's when you have a large time gap when you're not fucking eating. And, but that's the way I think people think, you know, I eat this protein. I have X amount of protein a day. I split up between four or five meals that those amino's are just in my blood all day. No matter what, I have sufficient amounts. And that's not true. You burn fucking through it and they go and they come when you eat. And when we're training, realistically, the way that I see and the way that I genuinely believe like the majority, everybody should really do it is they're eating at least, at least an hour before they train, at least sometimes up to three hours. And then they're having like probably an hour after they train. So when they eat, so they have this huge time gap where they're not having that, that pro those protein sources. So it would only make but, sense uh, to I'm have. Gonna, I'm going to steal a, a legendary Milos Sarsev quote. Yeah. Milos is when huge is, on this. When is your, when is your blood flow highest? During your training. During your training. Now we, what, what, what now? And, and that specifically is going to be to the muscle that you're damaging. Yep. Why would you send empty blood? Exactly. Send blood filled with new. That's why Milos loves the insulin. Insulin, EAAs, carbs, why would you, all why that. Would, why, why, why would you send empty blood? Exactly. Because people think you don't need it. They think they already have it in their system, and that's just not the reality. And, and then this they is also, why intro work, this is why intro workouts are so effective. And this is why they also say, though, why would I use EAAs when I could just use a uh, protein powder? It's because like, now you have to digest that. Now you have to digest that. During, it's not the same thing. And that's another good point about intros. You want to have the least breakdown necessary. Yeah. And that's why we use EAAs or in an extreme example, an extreme situation, I'll use a whey hydrolysate. Yeah. Which is a broken Hydrolyse down way. to dye and tripeptide. Yes. Instead of, instead of, I wouldn't use a whey isolate. Yeah. Hydrolyze is what I've you used know? for guys that like have to wake up super early and they don't have time to eat. It's just like, you know, a carb, you know, intra carb, you know, like HG muscle has theirs, revive has theirs, or like the carbolin and a hydrolyzed whey. But this goes back to what we talked about before with the nervous system shift. If I put something into your digestive tract that you have to break down, yeah. you're going to compromise performance. Yep. The reason why we use highly branched cyclic dextrin is because it transits fast and requires no breakdown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As soon as you start drawing blood to your stomach for digestion, you've just drawn blood away from your muscles. Yeah. And you've just compromised your ability to perform. That's why cluster dextrin is so good for carbs. Yes, because it yeah. doesn't require any of that. Okay, if you talk... start packing your in... if you start packing your intra drinks with things, then yes, that starts to happen. You start to turn on digestion and turn off performance. And this is another reason why, again, John Meadows said that intra drink has to be thin, not thick, because if too much of it yeah. hits you, a at lot once, of water you're turning on digestion. A lot of water. Start drinking it before you when get. I to was the gym. doing what I was doing. When I was doing 100 grams of 100 to 150 grams of carbs in your workout, it was in 60 ounces of water, half a gallon. Mm -hmm. And I would finish the whole thing because if too much of those nutrients hit you at once, you just you're going to shift your nervous system and kill your performance. So it's got to be like you shouldn't be chugging that drink. I have my guys try to finish about a quarter of it before they even get to the gym. So yeah. now you've got three quarters left and that you're going to be sipping on, not chugging for the rest of the workout. Because yeah. if you chug it, you're going to kill your performance. Yeah. So we so we got EAs down. Let's talk about carb, intra carbs, because, you know, I saw you talk about this other day. I saw Mahali talking about it. Um, I always pretty much put intra carbs for anybody that's trying to grow. Like I'll have some type of intra carb supplementation. If it's if Ooh. we're cutting if we're cutting food down, it's probably one of the first places I may cut it from, depending how how low we are. But I think not Three. for one. It is you know, an easy place to place extra food and two, I feel like it always just having that there helps with performance. You know, your blood glucose is going to drop during training if you're fucking training hard and that helps to keep your, your training more effective. I'm, I'm, I'm more ectomorphic. Yeah. So, so I you burn right through it. Yeah. A, I have an insanely fast metabolism, like crazy fast. 
Like I've never not, not had abs in my whole life. And I used to fucking sit on the couch and eat McDonald's at times. Yeah. So um, for somebody like me, if I have a hundred grams of carbohydrates, two hours before my workout, um, I'm going to burn that the first 10 minutes and then I'm going to go flat. The only way I can hold a pump is an intra workout carb. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise my blood sugar is just going to tank. First of all, because my metabolism is so fast and because I use my brain so much because the brain feeds off glucose. And they actually, somebody, somebody just researched re- re- something recently said two hours of hard critical thinking burns as many calories as like 20 or 30 minutes of cardio. It's crazy. So my body preferentially favors glucose, doesn't like the tap into fat. Yeah. So I, my blood sugar will crack. Like you can see, I posted experiments on YouTube. I posted experiments on my, on my social media pages. My blood glucose will fuck. Like I've, I've, I've shown people, I ate like 200 grams of cream of rice and my blood sugar will hit 64 two hours later. Like my body will fire through it. So I need a constant source or I can't fuel my workouts, you know, and you're going to get people like that. Now, if I have somebody who's more endomorphic, they're still going to have intra carbs, but it's going to be less. Yeah. And, and, and to the other point, yes, when I get somebody in deep prep, you know, the workouts are going to be shorter, first of all, because we don't have the recovery capacity when you're 6% body fat. Yeah. But you don't want to waste carbs on a fucking drink. I don't want to waste carbs on a drink because they're fucking starving. Yeah. No. So technically would the intra carbs be optimal? Yes, but you're going to lose the mental side and the stress side from the food they're not eating. So yeah, you're, you're weighing, fucking starving. So it's not even worth it. Well, you're point. weighing, you're weighing cost versus reward. I'm, I'm willing to give up 5% performance to get that mental satiety and, and, and keep cortisol. Cause remember if somebody's always stressing and starving, cortisol is going to be up. Yeah. Yeah. And of if course. Cortisol is up. Now we're going to have a hard time losing body fat. We're going to be holding a lot of water. Digestion might, might flare up from the stress. So it's going to reduce stress by giving them more whole food. So I think that that's the better option when somebody's really, really lean and starving all day is to give them food rather than supplements. But you would say for like all right these now I give right now I give my guys whey protein and cereal post workout. When they're deep prep, I give them chicken and rice. Yeah. Because they want food. They want a meal. Yeah, that feels like nothing when you're in prep. It's just gone immediately. It feels like nothing. Nobody wants to drink a protein shake when you're starving. Yeah, no. It's gone. But back to back to your point here. So you think all guys, you know, listen to this, you know, kids just trying to grow, put on mass, they should have intra carbs. I'll put intra carbs in programs. And I don't know if you've had this, but you know, a lot of clients, like uh, you get clients who just like don't follow the fucking protocol. Like they just think like supplementations are optional and they don't realize like the intra carb is literally contributing to the workout and, and contributing calories. Right I, I put the intra shake in their diet section. I do it too, but sometimes they just see it and they're just like, I, even though I make it clear, you can make things as clear as you can to some people and they just still like, it's supplements like I don't really need and they don't realize it's literally contributing to the workout. You, you, you get a different demographic than I get because you get of, guys that are already you know, super serious. They're already, they're nobody, already listening. Yeah. Everybody, everybody, nobody signs up with me that doesn't know who I am. And when yeah. they sign up with me, they already know that. Yeah. I definitely I'm get more like gen, more gen pop people. So you think I might not need the these guy, supplements. I'm, I'm the coach. I'm the coach you hated in sports, but you realized made you good. Yeah. You like there's there's no option to follow my program. Mm-hmm. Do it or I'm gonna drop you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and I think that as time passes and you accomplish more, you're gonna attract more of that demographic. But listen, yeah. if you're having that problem, I'd make it clear from day one. I always Nothing make it clear, is, trust me. This is not negotiable. Trust me, I make it I make everything as clear as you can and it gets frustrating the um, amount of people that just, you know, even though you repeat it so many times, they just, you know, two months goes by and I'm like, what are you taking? They've been taking only fucking multivitamin. I'm like, what do you mean? All this stuff is here. Like this is this is for a coach, this is for anybody who's a coach that's viewing this right now. And um I've told you this personally, and I've said this in my class. If somebody's not going to execute the plan, it doesn't matter how good of a coach you are because the plan's not going to work if it's not done. So, yes, you may need the money, but on the back end, your reputation is going to be hurt because you're going to have a whole handful of people who got no results who are going to blame you. Yeah, so exactly. I would rather I would rather lose a couple hundred dollars a month and get rid of the person that's going to hurt my reputation because you only have one chance at building your brand. And once your brand is tainted, it's done. You're not going to recover yeah. from a bad reputation. So don't allow people to hurt your reputation. If they sign up with you and they're not listening, it doesn't matter if you need a couple hundred dollars because you're going to lose thousands and thousands and thousands on the back end. If you let 
enough people hurt your reputation because they didn't get results. And I promise you, if you got 10 people that didn't get results, five of them are bashing you and blaming you. Yeah. Yeah. That's how everybody, you see guys work with, you know, coaches who, you know, are good coaches all the time. They're like, he didn't do this. He didn't do that. And like thinking they know better. They go around running their mouth. It's like, really like you just didn't listen to anything. Like you were a shit client. I take, I take criticism on coaches with a grain of salt because a lot of people, clients will even go as far as to lie. Clients lie to coaches all the time. Just so, well, just, just so the responsibility is not on them. They lie to themselves. They blame the coach when it was never the coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, and that happens. So my, my advice is have the conversation once happens again. I'm sorry. Here's a refund for the rest of the month. I wish you the best. Don't wish you bad, but I'm not working with you. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's how it should be. Cause you know, people can definitely fuck your entire reputation just by going around lying just because they want to victimize themselves at the end of the day. Listen, you've seen the backlash that I've gotten from the community for being open and honest and truthful and speaking my mind and saying things that people don't want to hear. Um, and I would have a horrible reputation right now if I gave people ammo. So I protect myself by not allowing those type of people to work with me. You can't find dirt on my coaching style because I don't allow it. If you're yeah, not executing, no. I get rid of you. You know, well, you I know, have listen, a, if I, if, what, what are you going to say? I was going to say, if I was fucking up, you'd hear about it all over the internet. Yeah. Well, I have an approval process for coaching. Like we go through, we check everybody, make sure like this person has the potential to be a good client. But even then, like you still get people who are good for a couple of weeks and they realize like, I fucking can't follow a diet or like, I can't, I don't want to, they just, they just drop it or so or really I'll get guys that are like 300 pounds and they're like, I want to run T3 on this stuff. I'm like, no, like we're not doing that. And then they'll go ghost. They just disappear. They just, and then they, Let them. yeah. Let them. Yeah. But, but you know what I have, I do, I, I have an approval process and people think that I always rate their genetics. They go, they'll say to me, I, I feel bad when people say this to me. Oh, I'm not no, it's good psychological. You, or, or you have so many pros and you're a top level coach. You wouldn't want to work with a guy like me. That's not true at all. I look for dedication. Your, your, you know, how coachable you are is what I look for. And I look for if we mesh. I am a tough coach. If you're sensitive, we're not going to work. Mm -hmm. So I don't work with sensitive people. I don't work with overthinkers. Yeah, I don't work with complete newbies because I don't work with complete newbies because I'm not going to explain to you how many calories is in a gram of protein, but you can Google that. Yeah. So I don't work with newbies. I don't work with overthinkers and I don't work with sensitive people because that's all going to translate to us having a bad rapport. And the best coach in the world is not always the best coach for you. It's going to be the coach that works best with you. You know, a lot of women work better with somebody who might not be as educated, but is more kid gloves, more, more gentle, more understanding, more positive and motivational. You know, mm -hmm. some people just need that. And, yeah. and I don't do that, you yeah. know? So, and, and, and lastly, hard workers if i don't think you're a hard worker who executes i'm not going to work with you yeah yeah i don't judge genetics or potential no. i judge your work ethic and your personality yeah because that's what it comes down to. if that person's going to execute the plan or not if they're going to cause problems if they're going to fucking have excuses every week and it just makes even if even if it's always their fault you know it always comes back to you what would i to identify when somebody applies to me if they tell me 10 times what their goals are and how how, how determined they are you're a talker talk people yeah. who talk that much are trying to convince themselves yeah. people that do shit and get it done they're like listen i'm I, I don't need a lot of attention tell me what to do i'm gonna get this done they just execute the plan yeah you don't even like really hear from them that much i'm telling you across the board the people that tell you a thousand times in a row and write you 50 paragraphs about how dedicated they are and how serious they are they're trying to talk themselves into it yeah yeah they just want your validation like oh you could do it yeah like you're you're on the right path but really no, but like, those, but those are never the people those are never the people that execute ever no no, I just want to hear that they're it's, that they're able to do it. Okay, one the one last thing I want to touch on before we wrap this up. We talked about this before. It's still a controversial thing. I want to hear why. I want you to explain why exactly we weigh meat cooked and not raw. Because people say you know the package is raw. We go by this, and this well, here's is the thing. Yeah, this could this answer could vary based on your country. You know, it depends on what your bylaws are and things like that. Um, in the United States, what people don't realize is you're allowed to inject a certain amount of sodium solution into a into a into meat for for preservative. You know, it can make it preserves the meat longer, and the variance on that would greatly change the raw weight. Um, whereas cooked weight is is going to lose 
a certain amount of water and always have the same end composition pending you cooked it the same. If you cook your steak medium every time and it's the same cut of steak, you're generally going to have identical nutrients. Yep. Now, uh, I've gotten chicken breast from the store and cooked it. And my pan was so filled with water, I was basically boiling the chicken. Yeah, I've had chicken breasts that were raw, like 10 ounces comes down to five and one comes down to like fucking eight. So it's just very, if you go by the raw weight, it's way more inconsistent than it would ever be cooked. The sodium solution that they inject into the into the meat allows them to charge more money. So some places just go fucking wild with it and will inject a ton of fucking water into the chicken breast or the meat or whatever it is. And, you know, you, you, you're you weighing an eight ounce chicken breast, but without the water, it's six, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. So, you, you know, I think that cooking, at least in the United States, because we have the loosest laws as far as that, um, is you're better off going with cooked weight. Now you've got some countries that are very strict. I heard Australia is very strict. Then you might be able to go raw weight because they can't inject fucking five ounces of water in the chicken breast. Yeah. You know, so you're getting a real raw reading versus a skewed raw re reading. Um, so, you know, it's going to be different. Um, and, you know, there's even variances when you talk about rice, for example. Um, I can cook a bag of rice or, you know, a, a pot of rice for a certain period of time, but I can I can at least add a quarter more volume by cooking it longer. Yeah. You know? So uh, it'll hold more water. So, mm -hmm. you know, you've got variants there too. There's always going to be variants. So the correct answer to this is just do what you've always done as consistently as possible. That's going to be, I, 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 I caught a client or I didn't catch a client. I posted about it in my story and then he texted me. He said, shit, I've been bringing all my fucking food cooked all year. I mean, uncooked all year. And we were starting contest prep. And my answer was, well, we're not going to change that now because this is what your response is based off of. You know, if we change the way you're the way we're weighing it now, we're going to get different results. So I said, the fact that you've already been doing it that way, don't change it. Keep it the way you've been doing it, because that's how I've been gauging your response off. But did you just say that just for the prep, like after he goes in off season, would you have him switch to doing I'm it? Gonna leave it alone. Leave it alone. No, I'm going to leave it alone. OK. Because yeah, but... it's it's been first of all, he's international. So it's probably a little bit more accurate. I have a lot of international people. I have people in Australia, Japan, fucking everywhere you can think of, UK, yeah, South Africa, everywhere. So the fact that he's international too gives me a little bit more trust than I would be in the United States with the weight of it. But the fact of the matter is I already have two years with him and that's how he's been doing it. So I would have to learn his body all over again if I changed it. So we're just going to leave it the fuck alone. Okay. But at the end of the day, still cooked will be more accurate cooked you're going to be, be left accurate. you're going to be left with the same result given that you know how to fucking cook which if you're a bodybuilder you I should hate know the how to cook. i hate the fact that so, listen people people have argued before that oh well i can i can burn a chicken breast and get it even lighter well you you burn your chicken breast to eat it yeah that, that's a stupid argument you don't know how to cook your food like you should be cooking your food the same cook, way yeah, every like, time cook your cook your food consistently yeah as consistently as you can and that's going to leave you with a more consistent result then, especially because people. Sure, I'm sure there's a lot of there's a lot of people watching this right now who have cooked a chicken breast in the pan and it's full of fucking water. And they that now they're now they're like facepalm and they're going, oh, that's what fucking happened. Fucking. Uh, what was I going to say? So, yeah, when you're you're left with the more consistent result every time when you cook, um, giving you know how to cook with you or if you're going by raw measurement, especially because that's what I was going to say. People will say, you know, if I just buy from the same brand every time, it's probably going to be consistent. But that's not even reality. You know, as a bodybuilder to travel and shit, you're not going to always be able to get it from the exact same source. There's going to be variants with brands too. Yeah. Yeah. So just going by your final cooked product, giving you cook it consistently is going to be your most consistent. You tell me you buy Purdue chicken breast. They always look identical. Yeah. No. No, but but even if that's the even if that was the case, you're not always going to be able to buy Purdue chicken. You know, you go places. You know, there's stores out of this place. You go to a different store. It's not always the same. But would you say so? That applies to chicken. You know, fish. What about like ground beef? Um, ground beef, I'm not necessarily sure of. Um, simply because you could cook out a lot of the fat too, depending on the percentage. So the weight's going to change drastically. When you but cook out the fat, beef, I... when you cook out the fat, do you leave that in the pan or do you do you toss it? I uh well I always go with grass fed ground beef 
So because those are all healthy uh, essential fats and uh, higher higher in omega threes, I keep it. I make mm-hmm. sure it stays in there because I want yeah. that. You know, I I, I specifically yeah. bought it for that. Yeah. First of all, I need, for your listeners, regular ground beef and grass fed ground beef are like two different foods. One's inflammatory, one's anti inflammatory. Yes. They're not even the, they're not even the same. You spend the money, get the grass fed, or, or you know, or you're gonna lose years on the end of your life. Grass, I think grass fed and finished is the best, the best one. But yeah, I mean that applies to eggs. You know, all meat stuff, you know, going with the people think it's just marketing, the organic stuff, the grass fit stuff. It's not. It, there is really a huge difference. And like I said, with eggs, with eggs, you could taste a significant fucking difference just lo- by even looking at it between like a basic, you know, white, you know, grade A egg versus those omega-3 eggs. Well, with eggs, you want pasture raised. Yeah. Pasture raised, vegetarian fed, you know. What you know, natural as possible. The more the more orange the yolk, the better. The more yellow, the worse. Yeah. But yeah, you should be spending the extra money on these things because it matters. It matters for your results. Matters for your insulin sensitivity. Matters for your composition. Matters for your arterial health. Matters for your long term health. Matters for your blood pressure. Matters digestion. What is it? Digestion, because like you said, red meat is very inflammatory. Red meat is very inflammatory. People think they yeah. yeah think they have problems, but maybe if they just switch to a grass fed source, they would those problems would disappear. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people have regular, experienced that. Regular red meat is higher in omega-6s and omega-9s. And arachidonic acid is an omega-6 uh, fatty acid. And arachidonic acid was actually released, I believe, called X-Factor by um, George Llewellyn, the author of the steroid Bible, um, because the inflammation response is anabolic. Um, that's why we don't take um, Advil and NSAIDs and things like that, and painkillers post workout because it'll kill the recovery response. The recovery response actually is anabolic, and he found that um, arachidonic acid actually is has an it has anabolic properties. Um, but its anabolic properties is because it's pro inflammatory. It's inflammatory, and and that's what we want to fight against. Now, all the all research is pointing towards inflammation for aging and cancer and all kinds of health defects. So you don't want to start putting inflammatory foods in your body carbohydrates and sugar is already inflammatory you want to add more yeah no no you know so we've just got to be smart about things but yeah generally food uh meats cooked uh cooked weight uh make sure you're getting you know grass-fed beef grass-fed butters um uh pasture raised free-range eggs things like that um that have the proper nutrient profiles you know but people just focus too much on the goddamn drugs and they're gonna regret it <laughs> yeah to yeah yeah well i think i think we covered a good amount today you said you were doing another class soon or no um yeah i should be releasing a class i, must, I wasn't I'm not sure exactly when but it'll probably be um in march um at some point i'm gonna do a cl- uh, another one of my contest prep classes it'll be on the weekend um as you know you've took the one that i took classes yeah, it's three point. It's uh, it's three and a half hours, two days, so yeah. seven hours total over the weekend. Um, there's a half hour Q and A at the end. You could always DM me with questions afterwards. Uh, the class is six hundred dollars. Um, obviously it covers everything start to finish with contest prep, along with strategy and a lot of most of the material. You're not going to be able to get out of a book. You won't read it. You won't find it on yeah. the internet. It's exclusively in the class. So yeah, I took um, it. It's very good. Inc- it encompasses things like strategy and, and, and all other things that matter that people don't consider. So um, I've seen a lot of good results from it. Typically coaches take my contest prep class because they use it with their clients and there's been a lot of success so far. I'm very happy with it. Yeah. So are you just doing that? Are you going to do like an off season class too, or anything like that? Um, or um, I, I, I have other classes written. I have about six other classes, but I'm saving that for when my following is a little bit higher um, just simply because um, when I release classes, like my content prep class sold out a couple of times and then it kind of slowed down, which is why I stopped doing it. Um, just because my following is not enormous. And, you know, like I said, only the very serious people follow me. So I'm waiting until my following is a little bit bigger to release those classes because I want to, you know, make it worthwhile. This is my life's work over 20 years of yeah. extensive, you know, research and hard work and just everything else that I put into it. And it's pretty much handed to everybody on a silver platter. So, you know. <laughs> Yeah, so you're gonna be doing the the contest prep again this one this next upcoming month or two though. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Well, everybody, go check out Phil if you don't already follow him. You know, on Instagram, I'm sure he'll make an announcement when he does drop that class. Uh, you know, I don't know if you're still gonna be posting on TikTok, but he posts some stuff on TikTok, some good information. He's one of the few few coaches that are actually on there willing to deal with you guys. <laughs> Talk is difficult because like I just I, I can't deal with the the trolls and the kids. It's not it's not that it, it irks me. It's just it's it's annoying, you know. I mean, yeah. Thankfully, thankfully, I have a lot of really good followers. Like when somebody 
tries to troll me, they typically get ripped apart on my page, so they don't try. And the people that really have tried, you could see some of the videos that I've posted where they regretted it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, I, I, you know, I, I'll get back on TikTok at some point. It's just the, the material that I do on TikTok is a lot different than the material I prefer to release. Yeah. All right. Well, drop a comment if you think Phil should get back on TikTok. And drop a comment if you think Phil should start making YouTube videos. If you guys follow him, you guys get him you know, up there. I'm sure he'll be motivated to make a lot more content. And then you guys will learn more. But thanks for coming on, Phil. I appreciate the time. Uh, and thanks for tuning in, guys. I'll see you on the next episode of Brass Tech Bodybuilding. Thanks, bro.